why don't we get started and um and that i hopefully this will be corrected in a few minutes and we'll be going out on um uh television but anyway okay welcome to the january 19th 2023 city council meeting i am city council president jim nash and i will be presiding this evening before we begin i want to let everyone know that this meeting and all participating on zoom will be audio and video recorded i now call the city council to order laura can you please call the roll Sure. Um, Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Foster. Here. Councillor Gore. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Labarge. Um, Councillor Labarge, you able to unmute? Here. Okay. Um, Councillor Maori. Here. Councillor Moulton. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. And Councilor Perry. Here. Council President, you have a quorum. Excellent, thank you. Now that we are convened, uh, next up on the agenda would be hearings, but we don't have a public hearing, which brings us to public comment. If you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature located on the bottom menu bar under reactions. If you are calling by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you are having trouble raising your hand, you may use the chat feature to send a message to Councillor Foster. Um, to ensure uh, equal access and because of the open meeting law, technical problems such as not being able to raise your hand are the only thing the chat function is used for and the chat function will only be available during public comment. We cannot accept comment over chat Private chat or chat only visible on Zoom during a public meeting is antithetical to an open public process in violation of the council rules for public participation and violates the spirit and potentially the law of open meeting law. If you want to submit a written public comment, please email it to citycouncil at northamptonma.gov and it will be sent to all councilors and will be part of the public record. I will unmute each raised hand in the order raised to make a comment. Before you begin, please state your name and your city or town for the public record. To ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to speak, the city council limits comments to two minutes. You are in no way obligated to use the full two minutes, but if you do, after two minutes, I will ask you to please finish your sentence. If you set your, your Zoom screen for gallery mode, you will also see the blue sky timer indicating how much time each speaker has. According to the council rules, we do not respond during public comment as it is your time to speak. So while your comment should be directed to us, you will understand when we do not respond. Our rules also state that counselors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect at all times. Your protected speech is a constitutional right and one that we ask you to wield with consideration and respect for all and do so with the recognition that the public space that grants you that freedom is shared equally by everyone. Also, according to open meeting law, if someone is disrupting a meeting, they may be removed. If you wish to speak on any topic, it doesn't need to be an item on the agenda. Um, I ask that all but the council turn off your video until called upon. Oh, only the person recognized has the floor and all comments are to be directed to the council. This meeting can also be watched on channel 15, hopefully soon, or by streaming on Northampton Open Media's YouTube and other platforms. Okay, let's see. All right, um, I think I see a lot of folks with their videos still on. Um, if you could turn them off. Uh, first up to speak is Lori Loisel. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Um, I wanna say I couldn't change my name. I am here as a resident, not for the Northwestern DA's office. So just kind of forget I, that. Thank you. 
Um, I'm a resident of Northampton. I've lived in Northampton since 1983. I want to thank you all for the work you put into making these decisions. I'm here to address the cannabis cap. Just to want to say I was happy when marijuana possession was decriminalized, and I think it was right to legalize it for a lot of reasons. And I think there's a need to enact local regulations to protect our community from the harmful impact of cannabis. It's your job as city leaders to develop public health conscious regulations, taking into account the most vulnerable of those who live and work here. To me, this is about inclu inclusivity and this desire to have a community that welcomes and embraces all of us. I want Northampton to be family friendly, youth supportive and recovery aware. Why not impose a cap? There is adequate access to cannabis. Legislation allows caps, which are not, by the way, prohibition. It is using the mechanisms allowed by law to fit this new industry into our community in a way that meets our needs and values. Saying we don't cap the number of coffee shops or clothing shops as reason to not cap is disingenuous and cynical in the way it ignores legitimate public health concerns around this particular industry. We face an alarming addiction crisis in our nation right now. This is about balance. It's asking elected representatives to think about all of your constituents, not just dispensary owners and others making money off legal weed, but families and youth and people in recovery. You represent them all. There's a well-documented addiction and mental health crisis in this country. It's your responsibility to balance the needs of free enterprise with the needs of our residents and use the regulation mechanisms at your disposal to meet those needs. A cap will hurt nobody, but it might help make this community feel a little more hospitable to people most vulnerable to addictive substances like cannabis. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Next up, Rick Haggerty. Hi, uh, I just want to make sure uh, you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, Rick. Oh, great. Okay. Welcome and you All have right. the floor. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Rick Haggerty. I'm from uh, Florence, uh, Massachusetts. And uh, I just want to say that um, I want to thank everyone uh, for reading all of the data that I've sent along. Um, I appreciate those who have uh, read what I've sent. Um, and, you know, it's from the heart because I've uh, lost my son to an addiction. Um, and we know that people in the community uh, have been harmed. Uh, the West Fing Springfield uh, uh, young uh, person who was working in a cannabis, uh, uh, you know, place for manufacturing. Um, and um, so many others could be harmed and have been harmed. Um, I do want to add as well that uh, the uh, uh, psychologist and brain disorder specialist, Dr. Amen, if you've read his work, has uh, issued a brain scan uh, comparison. And that is that five years of smoking cannabis is equal to three years of doing opiates. You can, you can look at the scans and his appraisal of that. You know, I also wanna say that I'm a elementary special education teacher. And I know that there's been quite a bit of harm through the, uh, um, you know, little uh, candies, you know, the cannabis laden that are mistaken and, so many other, so much other harm that can come to children as well. But one of the things I want to say that as a teacher, uh, I do my best to model fairness, respect, trustworthiness, and responsibility. And I ask of that of my students as well. So I want to thank all of our counselors for all the hard work they've done. And I'm asking for that same kind of fairness, respect, trustworthiness, and responsibility uh, toward our citizens and uh, would certainly request a cap. Uh, so again, thank you for all you've done. I know it's been a lot. It's been a lot for me since the August of this summer, and I appreciate the time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. All right, next up is Heather. Welcome, Heather. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, counselors. I too want to thank you for all the work that you've put into this and all the inquiries that you've made to you know, ensure that you understand the data that we have and, and that sort of thing. Um, we know that youth in Hampshire County are accessing retail products. We know that youth who live in towns with five or more retailers in Hampshire County are more likely to use more frequently and more heavily than those in communities with fewer retail outlets. We also know that there's inequities related to race and income. Um, 
in terms of youth use. But right now today, I just want to speak about um, some other sort of public health thoughts. The mayor and others are saying that cannabis market is waning and that the number of establishments will self-regulate. And I would pose that we don't know that. The cannabis industry is still new and is going through growing pains. Right now in Northampton, the reason we have a cannabis retailer closing and few new applicants may not be a simple equation. The price of cannabis is plummeting and space rental prices are high. As new regulations emerge to limit cannabis canopy in Massachusetts, this may change how retailers view the market. And as new products emerge and as social cafes come into existence, this too will shift the market and may renew interest in opening additional retailers. We don't know, this is new. We should be thinking proactively about what we want our community to look like and not wait until we find ourselves reacting to public outcry and stuck in a situation where there are new applicants that have vested, invested money to open in Northampton and we could risk a lawsuit for trying to limit the number of shops at that point. Short of setting a cap in 2018, this is now the time to set a cap. The market is truly, if the market is truly saturated, this will do no harm. Where public health is concerned, being proactive is important. Big tobacco. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, appreciate it. Take care. You too. Okay, next up is Rebecca. Who did I, I think I might have. Rebecca, are you there? I'm here. Thank you. Welcome. You have the Thanks. floor. Thank you. Rebecca Buzanski. I'm a resident of Northampton. Good evening, everyone. I'm speaking tonight to urge the city council to vote in favor of the cap on marijuana dispensaries. I am not opposed to having legalized pot shops in Northampton. I'm speaking because I'm deeply concerned about the negative impact so many pot shops are having on our kids and on our downtown business district. Northampton has a disproportionately high number of dispensaries per capita, and this increases access and normalizes cannabis use for our kids. According to the State Cannabis Control Commission, Northampton currently ranks second in the number of cannabis retailers in Massachusetts, only behind Boston uh, in the high number of dispensaries. The Northampton Depar Department of Health and Human Services recently reported that proximity matters and that we are seeing this in Hampshire County. The more adult use cannibal, cannabis retailers, middle and high school students report are within a 10 minute drive of where they live, the greater their own 30 day cannabis use. Again, let there be no confusion. Our kids are using more because of the high number of dispensaries in Northampton. While serving as the Northampton School Committee member, I was the liaison to the Northampton Prevention Coalition from 2017 to 2021. During this time, our middle school administrator started finding NEDA cartridges at JFK for the first time ever. This increased access to dispensary products doesn't make our kids safer, as some might want you to believe. It increases access and it increases use. I'm also concerned about the negative impact this high number of pot shops are having on our downtown. Not only does downtown um, Northampton need a greater diversity of stores and fewer vacant storefronts, but ultimately the high number of marijuana dispensaries is hurting our downtown and contributing to the problem of vacant storefronts by driving up rent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Michael. Willers. Good that? evening, everyone. Hi, counselors, and thank you for doing the often thankless job that you do. And hello to my fellow Northampton citizens. I'm Michael Willers. I'm a pediatric cardiologist at Mass General and also a resident of Florence. And I'd like to speak in favor of cannabis caps. I am not anti-marijuana. I am, however, pro-youth and pro-Northampton, which is where my position comes from. In terms of being pro-youth, we've seen the data from Spiffy, which was gathered right in our hometown, that Rebecca was talking about that showed the closer young people are to a cannabis dispensary, the more likely they are to use. And the more, um, the more uh, cannabis use uh, that happens among young people, the more injury occurs to their brain and their hearts and their lungs. 
In particular, cannabis can cause psychiatric issues to young people, including outright frank psychosis that can last for days. It can also cause neurologic and developmental impairment and addiction. Don't the cannabis industry would like you to believe that cannabis is not addictive? Don't believe you don't believe that the medical literature states otherwise. Closer to home, cannabis can cause cardiac arrhythmias, heart rhythm problems. I've seen it in my own practice. It can cause a sudden drop of blood pressure and loss of consciousness, which I also see with some frequency. Finally, smoking cannabis leads to the same heart and lung disease that tobacco does. That's been well documented. And we don't exactly know what vaping will do because that is still new. But I can guarantee you in 20 or 30 years, we will find that toxic metals and chemicals do not do good things to lungs. Finally, from a pro Northampton standpoint, if we let the market sort it out, there is just going to be increased turnover of storefronts. More storefronts will lie empty. Landlords will keep the rents high, holding out for cannabis stores to come in, and we will continue to see a empty downtown. The mayor has said that a well-regulated cannabis industry is important to Northampton. If so, then let's regulate it well, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is Adele Franks. Welcome, Adele. Did we unmute you? Oh, I think I'm unmuted now. Now you can go. <laughs> My name is Adele Franks. I live in Florence. And I am here tonight to speak in favor of the financial orders uh, asking to appropriate CPA funds for affordable housing. And in particular, the CPA funds for uh, Habitat for Humanity homes on Burt's Pit Road, because uh, that represents one of the very few paths to home ownership for low-income people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adele. Okay, next up is Patty Healy. Welcome, Patty. Hi, thank you. Patty Healy from Northampton I'm on Longfellow Drive. I'm speaking in favor of the proposed ordinance to establish the cap. And um, I'm a registered nurse. I worked in addictions. I want to say I really appreciate the comments prior to mine um, in, in favor of the cap. So I'm not going to repeat what they said. Um, some other comments that I'd like to make is around um, how the, you know, the alcohol industry post prohibition also became heavily regulated and taxed but did not stop the use of underage drinking or the the huge amount of alcoholism in our country um but even more important something i recently learned is big tobacco built a profitable cigarette addiction model by suppressing well you know this suppressing and manipulating health data and it took 40 years for a public health campaign to counter the disastrous effects of smoking and um, to save lives. Well, guess who's investing in the marijuana industry? The maker of Marlboro cigarettes. Altria has invested already $2 billion in the Canadian marijuana company, Kronos, another $12 billion in Juul in 2019 in Canada. Imperial Brands, one of the biggest international brands, is investing in, um, as well, um, in uh, big, very big tobacco companies that are beginning to invest in marijuana production. Um, Altria also lobbies U.S. federal lawmakers. Clearly, they want to see um, the legalization na uh, nationally, federally. Um, but um, they, um, Altria also owns Canopy Growth, which is a giant manufacturer ma um, marijuana firm, which who just hired House Speaker John Boehner to be their chief lobbyist um, at the federal level. Um, but more food for thought, um, retail and medical licenses in some states now outnumber food chains. Colorado has more marijuana retail sites than all of McDonald's and Starbucks put together. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. All right, next up is oh. Mimi Odgers. Hello. Mimi Rogers, Ward 6. Um, I am going to be in the minority this evening, it takes, because I'm speaking against the cap on uh, cannabis shops. I say this because it seems as though when you do this, what you're basically doing is you're going to be creating winners for the people who actually already own the cannabis shops. In capitalism, 
we have markets to have people challenging those businesses, but you're basically protecting all of the businesses that are currently in place because they're not going to have any future competition. So they can do whatever business practices they want. They could choose to raise their prices. I do not here to say that it's cannabis can't be problematic, that all these other things are problematic. Um, Patty Healy just talked about how in Denver there's more cannabis shops than McDonald's and Starbucks. Well, McDonald's and Starbucks are really bad for our youth, <laughs> the food that they eat. And there's a lot of really bad things out there. And, you know, the video games and, uh, you know, the rock music. I mean, I just feel like, you know, <laughs> I get the fact that there are a lot of bad things out there. They have always been bad things. And we have all grown up with all the bad, challenging things. Um, but I just don't think that choosing a, the magic number of 12 makes any sense. And the magic number of 12 can actually go up. It's not a real number because in the ordinance, if I read it correctly, if socially, if some groups of so that weren't represented before come in, they can uh, get a cannabis shop. So you could tr potentially have 20 shops as long as we're being socially thing. And I just think government shouldn't get involved in the business market. If you wanna regulate hours, if you wanna regulate uh, how much THC can be in products or anything like that, I would be in agreement of the government can be thinking about those health aspects. But to, to regulate business, I mean, we are stuck with Comcast because government makes an agreement and we're paying out the nose for services. So I just don't agree with it for those reasons. It's just, I don't think government should be picking winners and losers when it comes to business. Thank you. Thank you, Mimi. Next up is... Well, an iPhone, and we will find out. Hello. Hi. Hi. I'll, I'll start my video. Wait a second. Um, I'll start my video, too. Um, my name is Mary. I live in... Did we lose her? Barry in Florence. I think we did. Okay, um, we'll watch for Barry to rejoin us and um, and we'll get her back in. We, we'll do our best to make sure we can hear from her. Next up is Jackie Balance. Welcome, Jackie. Hi, everybody. I never in my, um, Jackie Balance from Florence. I never in my wildest dreams when I was in college back in the 60s dreamed that I would one day complain that there were too many pot shops in my town. Really and truly, this is um, the nicest problem anybody should have. But still, if I had my druthers, we would have a cap in the single digits. I think a handful of pot shops would keep the city of Northampton and visitors high for a long time. I think that the sponsors of the ordinance to cap the number of pot shops are in touch with the um, with their constituents and they know what the grassroots want. I would suggest if you were really concerned about controlling business, you could put a two-year cap on the ordinance. See, see, see how long the cap, how well the cap works and reevaluate it later, but we really, uh, right now we're swimming in cannabis. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. All right, next up is Dick Evans. Welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, you good. Have uh, well, first, let me say I, too, support the uh, Habitat for Humanity uh, grant for the project on uh, Birch Pit Road. Uh, and, uh, it's a good thing. Uh, we, we're coming together tonight in a cloud of ambiguity. Uh, with regard to what this uh, cap measure as drafted is really all about. Is it to protect existing dispensaries from further competition as the sponsor declared when she introduced it? Is it to protect young people from legal cannabis when as we all know, they can't even get into the licensed stores? Is it to protect the public health by, by, by driving consumers to the, to the illegal market where products are untested, or by allowing uh, unlimited number of dispensaries so long as all of them, except for the first 12, are owned by social equity candidates? Or is it, like some people have suggested, to send a message? And if that's the point here, 
if the point of this measure is to send a message, then why not do so with a resolution that reveals what this is all about instead of cluttering up the city code with a prohibitory measure that has not been very thoroughly thought through. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me just close with urging every member of this council to heed the words of none other than Calvin Coolidge himself, who declared famously that it's better to defeat a bad bill than to pass a good one. It's time we listen to Calvin Coolidge. This is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up is Henry. Hey everyone, I'm Henry. I'm from Northampton resident Ward 5. Um, I'm here to air my opposition to the dispensary cap. The academic literature surrounding youth consumption is inadequate to support this legislation. While tobacco retail density may be correlated with youth consumption, there is no research to suggest that this is the case with cannabis. Before the city council can make a good decision on this legislation, we should request new data that is relevant. And furthermore, no one appointed me as a representative of the youth community, but as a 20 year old who grew up in Northampton all my life, I don't see a cap on dispensaries as something that will help our community. But I know what will help keep our youth safe and healthy, and that is access to honest, no-nonsense education on harm reduction and safe use. It is access to fentanyl test strips and addiction counseling without strings attached to carceral institutions. Largely, the government has lost the trust of the youth community through ridiculous programs like D.A.R.E. and propaganda campaigns like Reefer Madness. These attempts to st stigmatize and use shame tactics surrounding addiction and public health have proven detrimental to our collective well-being. Please consider rejecting this legislation and providing real harm reduction infrastructure to our youth. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Next up is, looks like Jordana, Jordana. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Jordana Willers and I'm here to express my, my support for the cannabis cap. I'm an expert in the field of youth and young adult substance use. As a trainer, um, I work with providers across Massachusetts. I live here in Florence and I can attest to the rise in extremely negative impacts of THC use among our youth, including here in Northampton. These negative impacts include worsening mental health conditions, including depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and psychosis. THC use can also lead to addiction. In fact, one out of six young people who use marijuana develop a cannabis use disorder. I see firsthand the suffering of young people and their families who have been severely impacted by marijuana use. In addition, youth who use marijuana are at a heightened risk for using other harder substances such as opioids, which can lead to death by overdose. And we have seen this impact in our own community. In recent years, there has been a huge increase in teenage deaths across the country due to overdose. I'm not only concerned about the future of young people in Northampton, but I'm also concerned about the future of Northampton itself due to the pro proliferation of pot shops without limit. Northampton was once known for its vibrant arts and music, which is why our family moved here. And now it's become known primarily for cannabis. This is not a legacy that I believe is gonna serve our children or our community. I highly recommend that the city think hard about what's right for public health and for the future of Northampton by limiting the number of pot shops in the city. Thank you. Okay, next up, um, we have Jack, Jacqueline's iPhone. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you. My name is Jacqueline McCraner and I'm from Northampton, Massachusetts. Thank you to all the council members and to our fellow residents for all their excellent comments. Um, I'm actually in agreement with almost all of the comments on both sides of the issue, um, but I fall on the cap side and I would like to respectfully urge the council to cap the number of cannabis retail establishments in our city. Thank you. Thanks, Jacqueline. Okay, next up is Bill Dwight. Welcome, Bill. Well, yeah, <laughs> thank you for welcoming me. Yes, I'm Bill Dwight, I'm in the city of Northampton. Um, I'm concerned, of course, about the proposed cap restriction for cannabis retailers that you guys are considering tonight along with everyone else, apparently. 
The other night, uh, one of the co-sponsors asked, why not? Why not pass this ordinance? Well, the reasons I'm concerned are manifest, but my most critical worry is the fact that, as written, this law is vague and unsupported. Um, I believe that whenever possible, ordinances should expand and protect rights, but if they're designed to be prescriptive, they should be proposed with a clearly identified and defined threat and a provable benefit and enforcement must be clear and fair. All of these elements must be included in the language of the ordinance so that in the future, the public and affected agencies may know the purpose and the rationale behind the law. Well, that's not the case here. It must be said that regardless of where you fall in this debate for or against the cap, everyone should know that it essentially does nothing, absolutely nothing. At most, it will skew a market in a way that really can't anticipate but it really protects no one from anything real or imagined, as you've heard described. It only possibly placates people who have expressed their feelings. And this is not a way to go about making good law, honestly. I mean, so far, what I've heard while this item was debated at Legislative Matters and tonight is that there are feelings being employed as reasons for making this move. There are folks who feel there are too many retailers, as you just heard. There are People who feel that too many cannabis shops inspires minors to feel more complacent about marijuana. The sponsors feel that the limit is fair. There are people who feel that Northampton will be known for things they prefer not to be known for. There were expressed concerns that the presence of retailers makes for a dangerous temptation. And I guess we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Next up is Anthony Peck. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilors. I appreciate the opportunity to provide with comments. So um, I live in Ward 2. Um, I'm also a professor of sociology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I've published research in the area of peer effects on adolescent drinking and smoking. So this is a, 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 an area that's related to my area of expertise. Um, <clears throat> when I wanted to raise um, or on more on the demographic side, I think you've heard from experts on the health side about the effects of cannabis use on, on adolescents, uh, which is a, a time of their lives when their brains are changing dramatically. The demographic side is my expertise, and I could tell you, give you some facts, since uh, I think the last speaker was talking about feelings, I, I'm, I'm also a believer of the cold hard facts. So, Mongovers have been tracking adolescent cannabis use for since 1991. Um, and just to give you some facts about this, uh, in 1991, daily cannabis use in the United States was 0.8% of, of 11th graders, I'm sorry, of 10th graders. Currently in 2020, it is now 4.4%. And I'm, again, I'm speaking here of daily cannabis use. So that's a five-fold increase. As a point of comparison, in Europe, uh, daily cannabis use still remains around 0.8%. So it's been steady. So we've seen in the United States a dramatic increase in daily cannabis use amongst adolescents. Um, I, I had a chance to listen to some of the theorizing that was related to the argument that um, putting a cap will lead to increased adolescent use of accessing the illicit drug market. The, the, the science basically says, is that's focused on this issue, is where, where do adolescents get their, their marijuana? And the answer to that is very few of them, or a very small percentage of them, get them from drug dealers. They get it from their friends. And so the, the key issue here is whether or not the adolescents get their marijuana indirectly through um, easy access, such as through recreational um, dispensaries. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. All right, next up, I believe, is the person who we lost earlier. Hello, this, hello. Hi, I hi. Um, my name is Mary. I live in Florence. Uh, I've lived here for 36 years, and uh, I just wanted to speak in favor of the cap. Um, I was a high school teacher for 25 years it, locally, and um, I saw the detrimental effects that that pot use had on my students. They uh, it, just in terms of their social development and their motivation. It just affected it tremendously. I also feel that um, we don't need 
one of these these shops, as many of these shops as as um, that that are are I'm sorry that our our community cannot support opening these shops um, one after the other. Uh, we moved here 36 years ago, and the city was a, a real jewel in the Pioneer Valley. Do we want it to become a mecca for m marijuana consumerism? Uh, it just it just bothers me that that it it has that reputation. Um, we restrict the number of liquor licenses we give out. I don't see what the problem would be in capping the number of um, of, of marijuana uh, dispensaries either. I'm sure that there have been accidents that have happened where children have gotten hold of some of these substances and, that are in the form of gummies and uh, brownies and, and even pets have accidentally ingested this stuff. And uh, I, I, I think that, that the, more, the more pot shops there are around, the more available it becomes. So I am definitely in um, in favor of putting a cap on the number of pot shops. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, next up is, oops, these screens move around on me. Schuler? Hi, my name is Skyler. Skyler, thank you. Yeah. No worries. Um, hi, my name is Skylar. I uh, recently moved to uh, Ward 1 um, from New York, uh, and I'm in favor of the cap. Uh, I guess a few of my thoughts right now are that uh, I don't think weed is like inherently evil or anything, um, but I also think that um, we should probably there was an equity clause of some sort, I mean, we should probably focus a lot more on what uh, we actually wanna do as a community to uh, create um, repair for communities that have been affected by the criminalization of marijuana before um, we go forward with uh, having more businesses come into town at least. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, oh, and I think kids will probably smoke weed no matter what. All right, thank you. Thank you, Skylar. Next up is Jason Weeks. Hello, how you, how's everybody doing? We're um, doing good, welcome, Jason. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm a, I'm a resident, a homeowner in Northampton. Uh, I'm in favor of no cap. Um, I believe that the cap will be detrimental to our uh, development of businesses in the town area. Seems uh, unfair to me considering that, um, you know, we, I'm sure that the cap on liquor licenses is much higher than the cap on, um, on dispensaries would be. And uh, I think the comparative um, damage that this would do to our community is uh, kind of, it's not parallel, you know. Um, Alcohol is proven to have much higher consequences. Um, it's more readily available. And we're also even, you know, allowing it for delivery nowadays uh, as it happens over the course of the, um, the uh, pandemic, you know? So if we're lowering the ability, uh, the uh, restrictions on alcohol, I don't see how we can be um, raising restrictions on the community and, and to, to raise these restrictions before we've, um, I believe properly addressed, um, as uh, the last speaker was saying, the um, the inequality of, of drug laws. Uh, you know, I, I don't know of any um, minority-owned businesses in Northampton that are cannabis uh, cannabis businesses. You know, um, and without having, if we put a cap right now, we're not even addressing that, and it's it's uh, hindering us in addressing that. You know, um, so. You know, without knowing the uh, the fine points, I guess, of the law, because I am kind of joining into this right now, and knowing what I've read on read on uh, in the newspapers and things like that, it seems like it's a bit hasty to be doing this. You know, um, and for a community that that uh, you know, on, on a side yeah. note, for a community that bases itself as a place for artists, and uh, uh, you know, these two businesses are running parallel, and we're kind of uh, 
cutting some people off from that. You know, I think the the base support each other. Done. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate everybody stopping when the bell rings. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, next up is Caroline Johnson. Welcome, Caroline. Hey there. Hey, welcome. Okay, so I'm Caroline Johnson. I live in Florence and I've presented local data on youth cannabis use in various uh, city council platforms and meetings over the past few months. And I have to say, um, I'm a little baffled about how some local data regarding youth cannabis use have been presented both by the media and by others who have been involved in this conversation as of late. Specifically, some have shared how youth cannabis consumption in Hampshire County has decreased dramatically since legalization without providing any context whatsoever when making these statements. So I wanna give some context now. Um, in past meetings, I think I've talked at least a little bit about the role of the pandemic in these trends, and I'm not sure why this isn't being acknowledged more seriously. The decline in Northampton is generally consistent with national reports like Monitoring the Future, which is funded by NIDA and conducted by the University of Mich Michigan. And, this, and Monitoring the Future shows that youth substance use fell significantly during 2021 nationally and then remained low in 2022 and on par with rates in 21. As federal public officials clearly state on their NIH website, reported use for almost all substances decreased dramatically from 2020 to 2021 after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and related changes like school closures and social distancing. So because of the ongoing pandemic, rates are lower than they otherwise would have been, which isn't to say that local or national data aren't reliable. It's simply saying that youth rates changed in response to things like limited social access. And we should be very mindful of that when looking at teen cannabis use rates over time, especially considering data that show how Northampton teens' perceptions of harm and parent disapproval have declined significantly, which are known and consistent predictors of youth use over time. So I just ask that you please consider data much more holistically and not in a piecemeal, piecemeal fashion as you consider um, anything related to cannabis moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Jeff. Hi, um, well, I'm here. I'm a resident of Northampton and I'm here to speak against a cap. I believe that this is um, a, a move that will essentially be playing to old uh, stigma and stereotypes about cannabis uh, that do not exist for alcohol and other, other substances that people use. Um, I'm a medical marijuana um, card holder, um, like uh, many other people, we use this medicinally. And th those of us, those people who do not use it medicinally, um, some would call it re recreational, but the, the dispensaries refer to it as adult use. And I, I mentioned that, that term because a lot of people so far have spoken about teen use. And while I recognize that there are teens who use cannabis, if you go to a dispensary, you have to show a you know, it seems like you have to show about 55 different IDs before you can get in there to prove that you're 21 and eligible to walk in there. So um, I do not believe, just like going to uh, any place where you need to prove your age, this is not, there are, we're not gonna have teenagers running into, into, into dispensaries. Um, the, I believe the marketplace will take care of um, whether the city can support enough um, dispensaries. There will be a certain point right now. We may be at that point where, where we already had one that closed. Maybe other ones will start to close. Maybe a couple more are open. I believe this is something that we can leave up to the marketplace. And like some other people, people have said, I think we should be devoting our energy toward, toward education for, for, uh, for youth and also to support people who do um, use any substances in excess, but we don't need to cap we don't need to cap this business any more than we cap liquor stores, coffee shops, or all the other things that people use in their daily life. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Hey, um, next up is Wendy Foxman. 
see if we can get you unmuted here. What's going on? She's um, there. There okay. she is. Welcome. Jennifer, here I am. Um, thank you very much. Um, you've heard a number of us a number of times. I want to just weigh in on the side of capping. Um, I am lucky to have gotten to know a, a lot of good, wonderful people in public health over many years and, and more this year, or at least the last six months. I have a great deal of respect for their work, their integrity, and the reasons why they do it, and their caring for youth. Um, and that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. Um, looking through the screens. I don't see any hands raised there. Nobody's queuing up. I think, I'm gonna, as always, I'll look at the agenda to see what's coming up next. Okay, seeing no more hands raised, um, we'll end public comment and we will now move into announcements from counselors and the mayor. Um, I think the mayor, um, the mayor is on her phone from a car. <laughs> she <And> is. <laughs> I'm wondering if she wants to say anything. Can you hear me? Oh, there she is. The mayor is, is tuning in remotely from somewhere on the Mass Pike. Welcome, mayor. Yes, okay. If we're recording live from the Mass Pike. Um, I do not have any announcements, but thank you so much for the offer. Oh, okay. Drive safely. Thank okay. you. I'm not driving, by the way. I'm not driving. I'm not the one driving. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, counselors, any announcements? Um, I see somebody's raising their hand on a phone, and we've already ended public comment. I'm I'm sorry. We're gonna, we're going to keep on with the agenda here, uh, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if the mayor might announce this, but on Tuesday, uh, January 31st, we're going to have a joint meeting of the school committee and the city council, uh, both school committees, I believe, uh, Smith Oak, as well as Northampton uh, Public Schools. Um, and the mayor will be presenting uh, the outlook, the budget outlook for the year. Um, so any, I don't know if anyone wants to add to that, but I just wanted to make sure that got announced since we won't have another meeting before that. That was a great announcement. Thank you. Any other announcements? Councillor Perry. Yes, I just wanted to make an announcement that uh, this upcoming Monday at the Community Resources Committee, we will be having a uh, roundtable discussion on neighborhood character, uh, energy and sustainability. We've got some great uh, special guests lined up. Um, a discussion with, um, I believe, Dory Brooks is coming, as well as our tree warden, Rich Parasoletti, uh, and Carolyn Mitch will be there. So hop on the Northampton.gov Agenda Center and come join us for community resources at 530. Excellent. And is that going to be hybrid or remote? It's going to be hybrid for the speakers, but uh, everyone else is invited to join us remotely. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I might need some help with these because folks may have seen them elsewhere. Uh, on February 4th at 9 a.m. at Smith Vogue, the Ag Commission is holding a, uh, a conference. I went to this conference a few years ago. It was really terrific. Uh, two different farmers spoke. And um, this is gonna be another opportunity to um, hear from our farming community and get some information. And they had some really great donuts there a few years ago. So um, I encourage folks to go and get some really good donuts. The other thing is the Survival Center. Um, I, uh, somebody sent me uh, that they're, they're putting out the word they need volunteers. So, uh, if you, if you have time to volunteer, the Survival Center is looking for help. Um, Councilor Mayori. Yes, I just wanted to announce uh, that on Sunday at 1 p.m. at City Hall, there'll be a bigger than row rally. It, uh, this is supposed to be, of course, the 50th year of 
uh, of row, and we um, cl clearly need to regroup and be together. Um, Rep. McGovern will be there. I'll be speaking. We'd love to see you. We'd love to plan our future and and feel a little bit of our own power in this really dire time for reproductive justice. So 1 p.m. Sunday, City Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, any other announcements? Seeing none, looking at the agenda. So next up is uh, presentations. And um, we have um, uh, Finance Director uh, Charlene Nardi here. She's gonna give us an overview. And um, and uh, I, I believe uh, in Councillor Maori, I think the plan is that, uh, that uh, Director Nardi is invited to the next finance meeting. And so the, the finance committee is, is going to be taking a deeper dive into this and that um, Director Nardi is going to give us the, it's a long agenda overview. <laughs> yeah, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, just really quickly for second quarter, I have provided you with five PDFs. Um, the first one is for general fund revenues. Uh, the second one is for enterprise fund revenues. Um, third is for general fund expenses, and the fourth is for enterprise fund expenses. And the final PDF that I provided you um, includes a overview of um, uh, hotel, motel, traditional lodging, short-term lodging, and cannabis revenue for the second quarter. So as we are in the second quarter, when you're reviewing the PDFs, you want to look at the right-hand column, which shows um, on revenues, the percent collected. So what you will be looking for there is you would love to see at least 50% or a number higher. Um, and when you're looking at expenses, you want to look for the reverse. You hope for a 50% or less expenditure for each of those budget lines. Um, just a real quick overview. As Council President Nash said, we are going to be going over this in detail at the um, uh, City Council Finance Committee meeting. So overall, things are looking really good. Um, we are on... Um, we are on track for meeting all our revenue projections and we are staying within our budgets and those are looking good as well. Um, and I will give a more in-depth um, view and, and go through each of the reports at that um, finance committee meeting. Otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, Councillor Labarge. Yes, thank you. Um, Director um, Chardin. At the Finance Committee, this is just a suggestion, please, that we have a screen put in place and what you're talking about and what items that you can pinpoint it. So if any residents do attend, they're going to have that visibility of seeing that. Talking, they don't have it. They don't understand what's happening here. So I think there's value by having it up on the screen and pointing to what you're talking about. Thank you. Yes, Councillor Labarge, I will make sure that I share the documents and I will point to the items as I talk about them. And I think that's an excellent idea. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions for Director Nardi? Well, Director, thank you for that very brief presentation. I look forward to grilling you at finance along with the rest of the finance committee. <laughs> and um, so I, I imagine you're sticking around for a few more of these financial orders, right? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the consent agenda. Um, we On the consent agenda, we have the January 5th, 2023 minutes. And we have uh, item 23.23, appointment to disability commission for referral to city services. So this is referring Amy Segura um, of Morningside Drive. And this is to serve on the disability commission. And those are the only two items on the consent agenda. Are there any requests for removals? All right, hearing none, I will entertain a motion. motion to approve. Okay. Second it. Motion made by Councillor Perry, seconded by Councillor Labarge. There's no discussion on the consent agenda. Roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Elkins. 
Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay. The consent agenda has been approved. Next up, we're on to financial orders. And um, the first item under financial orders is item 22.222, in order to appropriate free cash for road safety improvements surrounding NHS. Um, this is in first reading, but also uh, there's a request from uh, the finance director and the mayor's office to, uh, to expedite approval this evening. Um, as this, um, here, I, I'm, for this order, I'm gonna do a little bit of reading here. Um, in order to appropriate free cash for road safety improvements surrounding NHS, whereas safety of pedestrians, bicyclists, and traffic surrounding Northampton High School has been an ongoing concern and is of utmost importance, whereas the city commissioned a traffic study to evaluate and recommend safety uh, improvements to the road, work, road network surrounding the high, Northampton High School area, and whereas the study recommends a range of improvements to the roadway network around the high school, including the installation of two traffic signals on the Route 9 corridor. Now, therefore, it be ordered that the sum of $500,000 be appropriated from the FY 2023 general fund undesignated fund balance or called free cash for the design, bidding, and construction administration of such safety improvements. And I, I suspect Director Lascalia is here. And... Um, and Director Nardi, who wants to? Director Actually, Liz Council President, may I speak? Director Nardi. That's the mayor requesting to speak. Oh, there's the mayor. Your voice is kind of tiny. <laughs> okay. The um, Go ahead, Mayor. Let me, is this any better? Yeah, that's yeah. a lot better. That's great. Wait, now I can't hear you. Hold on. Oh dear. Hold on one sec, everybody. I can't find it. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I apologize that the audio is not great. Um, this is not the plan for this evening. But weather has other uh, other plans for us. Okay, so um, I was very happy to be at Transmission Parking City Commission meeting on Tuesday, where we had a very robust discussion about this. Um, I think almost every counselor was in attendance for that discussion, so this should all sound very familiar. Um, we had the Fuss and O'Neill study of the intersection of the high school. We, we received that study that we um, asked for and had an opportunity to meet with Fuss and O'Neill and ask him to follow up with some questions. And, Basically, the, their largest or primary recommendation is for signalization at Elm and Woodlawn as it meets the warrants for signals at both of those spots, um, but is too small an area that is uh, has parkland on both sides of it, so you cannot put a route about it. But it does meet the warrant for a signal at both of those locations. Um, so it, there's also an additional recommendation that we reopen the street that's directly in front of the high school that had been there and that uh, become a one way for buses only. Um, so I have made this project and making this area safer um, a critical priority. And I would like to move forward as quickly as possible with the planning and design of these main recommendations for Bus and O'Neill. Um, because they will have the largest impact on safety. As we've seen from other recent projects that involve signals, um, the engineering and design for putting up the signals and the installation actually takes quite a bit of time and resources. It's not as fast as um, I think uh, one might think it would be to just hang the lights. So um, 
So I want to, again, get this ball rolling as fast as possible so that we can get the design done and put it out to bid. Um, there are also some roadway changes and some smaller changes that we can implement um, before we actually do the road work and then make signals and um, we'll be moving forward with those. But to begin the planning and the engineering and be able to go out to bid as soon as possible, we brought this to TPC on Tuesday um, and are here today with this order to appropriate $500,000 in ARPA lost revenue funds to begin the design, the bidding, and the construction and administration for this project. There will be significant appropriations needed as the project goes forward, but I think this is a good use of these lost revenue funds to be able to get this moving now um, as soon as possible. And I, I thank the, the county for considering um, to the readings on it. Um, Director Ostalia spoke at length about this at TPC, and um, she's here tonight, as you noted. Um, and um, you know, again, I just wanted this to get started as fast as possible. We, there's been a call from the community to do that, and rightly so. And um, we just want to create a safer intersection here. So um, she can speak more specifically to the project if you have questions. Um, she could also speak to the work that we're doing to make this a school zone. Um, now that the state allows high schools to be designated as school zones, thank goodness, it seemed very silly that they couldn't be. Um, so we're very grateful for that change. And we've applied for a MassDOT Safe Routes to School grant for a speed feedback and school zone speed limit sign. So that's one of those signs that tells you how fast you're going and flashes and says that it's a speed um, zone. I mean, sorry, a safe a school zone. Um, so we've applied for one uh, here at this place at the high school and also at Smith's vocational, um, a little bit up the ways on Route 9. And uh, we're very, we're hoping that we will be granted those signs. And um, I just want to give a, a quick shout out to Senator Coverford because um, the grant states that communities can apply for only one school in their community. And uh, when we called her and said that you're the only community that actually has two school districts, we would like each district to be able to apply for one school. Um, she agreed and helped to get MassDOT to file the application. So a very hearty thank you to Senator Hooper for that help. Um, and here's hoping that uh, we are granted those signs. I think um, it's very scared to um, get, you know, um, have it be more yes, visible that those are simple enough that they will have paid those. And so with that, um, I will hand it back over to you and to Director Lascalia if there are any specifics. Thank you, Mayor. Director Lascalia. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, that, that was a good summary of um, kind of a lot of activity um, that we've been engaged in um, to, to just try to make the, the corridor around the high school safer. Um, so uh, as the mayor said, uh, about a year ago, we engaged our engineering firm, Fuss and O'Neill, to take a comprehensive look at the roadway network around the high school. So not just the Route 9 corridor, but also Elm Street, Milton Street, Riverside, um, that intersection, um, the, the old bus loop in front of the high school, um, the circulation within the actual parking lot at the high school, um, be, because any improvements that we're looking to implement really have to be part of a network of improvements. Um, when, when we engaged Fuss and O'Neill, we asked them to look at a variety of scenarios, including the installation of uh, roundabouts on Route 9. We asked them to look at um, you know, the potential for one-way streets, the potential for closing of, of intersection um, at Route 9 and Elm Street. So we asked them to look at a variety of different scenarios as part of their research of the area, you know, we, we, with the ultimate goal of improving traffic safety. So, so we're not telling them, oh, we think we want a traffic signal here. Um, we're giving them a lot of different options uh, about what we're potentially looking at before they make a recommendation to us. So uh, they, they took a, a quite a bit of time and a, and a very comprehensive look at the area and they made a variety of recommendations 
starting with significant changes to the Route 9 corridor that involved the installation of, of two traffic signals, one at Woodlawn and Route 9 and one at Elm Street and Route 9, as well as uh, realignment of, of the intersection with Milton and Riverside, the reopening of, of the old bus loop in front of the high school, changing the circulation uh, within the high school parking lot, permanent parking restrictions on the park side of Route 9 by Elm Street, um, some modifications to parking on Woodlawn Avenue and other more minor changes to Route 9, like uh, bump outs and, and pedestrian refuge islands. Um, so it, it's really kind of a, 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 um, a, a basket of recommendations that, that sort of all work together to increase uh, traffic, bicycle and pedestrian safety in the area. Um, and, and what we have at this point is a conceptual plan. So the next step um, is we actually have to move to a formal design process for all of these improvements that are contained within the conceptual plan. Um, and, and our design firm needs to generate actual drawings that we can build something with. Um, and, and, you know, just to, to sort of clearly I, I guess, talk about schedule, you know, these projects are very long developing. So we, we will likely be looking at a, a design period of about 12 months. Um, so at this time next year, I would expect to have pretty close to a final design um, for all of the improvements that, that I just talked about with, with actual details and a big package that I can actually put out to bid to hire someone to build it. Um, but, you know, we have sort of limited time to work with in terms of a building season. We, we, we want to avoid being under construction when school is in session. So we're working with very, very tight windows. The reason that we're asking for two readings tonight um, is so that I can engage uh, a design firm to uh, to to actually start working on the construction documents that I need to put this out to bid in the hopes of potentially starting construction in the summer of 2024. So that would be next construction season. Um, and and it's unclear at this point if we could actually complete construction in one construction season, you know, often these projects can stretch over two construction seasons. Um, so really time is of the essence and, and we want to move as quickly as we can um, to, to just kind of continue the momentum that we've built here. You know, in the meantime, there are there are some sort of minor improvements that we might be able to do with our line striping contract. Um, this spring and summer, but the substantial changes um, are, are really going to come, you know, next construction season. So I'm happy to take any questions that that anybody has. Thank you, Director. Counselors. Stan, your video is doing some strange stuff. Um, Councillor Foster, then Councillor Jarrett. Thanks. I, I don't have any questions, Director. Just wanted to, um, I was able to thank you at the Transportation and Parking Commission meeting, but just wanted to reiterate that again this evening, um, the traffic by the high school um, is is an area in need of safety improvements. I mean, that's that's an understatement. And um, you've, you and um, the mayor um, have really brought this forward um, in pretty quick time for municipalities. Um, and I really um, just want to recognize that and thank you for your leadership on that. Um, you know, it's there was a morning that um, Director Laskelia and Chief Casper and I um, stood outside and watched traffic, um, you know, enter the high school during um, drop off time. And, you know, it was that was there was just kind of so many different movements and so many different things going on um, and, and a recognition that that. Um, accidents have happened there and, um, you know, the, the sooner we can move on this, um, the sooner we can make it safer for commuters and students and teachers um, and everybody who travels through that every day. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for everyone's work on this for the past, it's been almost a year and a half, I think. Um, so yeah, I do, I think that overall, you know, these proposed improvements are, are very good. Um, I do, and some of this was talked about in the meeting, and um, but I just want to mention, um, you know, the that I think more needs to be added because a signalized intersection alone won't 
solve the speeding problem. People can still speed right through those signals. Um, and the speed reports, you know, we heard showed significant speeding problems. So um, those two intersections, like what methods, I guess, could we use to slow traffic um, that is passing through, you know, those two signalized, proposed signalized intersections, and then the Riverside, Elm, and Milton intersection, where people really speed down that hill, um, and it can make for some difficult uh, <clears throat> turn, you know, when you're trying to get out of there. Um, so there's that that question. What what can we add? Um, which I'm sure will come out during during the process. Um, and then I get a concern around the timing of this. You know, this report uh, it's dated December fifth, and I first heard about it a week ago. I immediately requested it. I received it on Tuesday. Had a few hours to read it before the Transportation Parking Commission. So. Um, and I'm not sure all of us even received it. So two days is a short time frame to consider this. I have had enough time, so I do feel comfortable moving forward. But I would request in the future that um, that we receive reports sooner uh, and have a little more time, therefore, to to consider them. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks, and I can just um, respond to a couple of things, Councillor Jarrett. Um, regarding the speed in the area, um, as the mayor mentioned, we are now under MGL um, able to uh, designate the areas around high schools as school zones. So um, that ordinance went through uh, Transportation Parking Commission Tuesday um, and, and we'll move to the full council for consideration at the next meeting. Um, but that will be immediate implementation upon positive vote by council. And um, what that will do is it will drop the speed limit to 20 miles an hour in the sort of the area around uh, the high school that is allowed by that statute, by that MGL. Um, and once we're able to install signage when school is in session, uh, the speed limit will by regulation be 20 miles an hour, um, which in turn becomes uh, an enforcement issue. So I really that entire uh, perimeter um, uh, around the high school. Uh, so the Route 9 corridor, um, they, you know, for, for several hundred feet on either side of the high school, as well as down the hill to Elm and, and Rivers, uh, or, I'm sorry, Milton, um, will be designated as a school zone. So, so the speed limit will be adjusted. Um, and, and regarding the report, so the, the way the reports work is that DPW receives the report in a, as a draft. Um, a, a lot of times, especially with a report like this that's been uh, months, um, if not a year in the making, there's quite a bit of back and forth that goes on um, between my department, other city departments, and the engineering firm to completely refine the report um, and get it to a place where we're ready to put the recommendations uh, out to the council and to the public. So we did receive the draft report at the beginning of December and then had several meetings um, to fully uh, vet the report and make sure that, that the data was accurate um, and also conversations around um, what it was gonna look like once the school zone could potentially be implemented because that was sort of a, a very recent development. Um, that, that came from the state. So we, we were able to turn this around um, in, in roughly a month, um, which is really record time. I, I mean, typically the vetting of, of these sort of infrastructure analysis is, is a very long process. So we moved as quickly as possible as we could with this um, to turn it around as quickly as possible. So I, I certainly understand the comment that that's the explanation behind it. Great, thank you. Thank you for the information about the school zone. I guess my follow-up question to that would be, um, will we be designing this these intersections to for a 20 mile an hour design speed as that will be the speed limit then in that area? Yeah, so part of um, our request to, to the design firm 
will be that they design this corridor. I mean, it's it's not even just the intersections. It's actually a whole corridor redesign, understanding that this is now a school zone and the speed limit is is, you know, by regulation, 20 miles an hour. So the answer to your question is, yes, that is part of the the design metric, if you will. Great. Thank you. Okay, counselors, any other questions? So I, I just want to add, I as somebody who's been advocating for changes around here around the high school for about 20 years, uh, this is really great news that um, that we're uh, investing in making these changes. Um, I, I, I too, like uh, Councillor Jarrett, I'm really interested in seeing I um, I I, I think there's we can do more than just signalize that I you know what from what we've seen what has happened on the transformation of Pleasant Street that by the way we design it that we can re really bring down travel speeds. Um, it was mentioned at the TPC the other day around some of the the work along this same corridor up by Smith that there's there's things that have been installed in terms of crosswalks and how the pavement uh, is that. You know, this this could be a spot where we we uh, go aggressive because it's the high school and um, and anything to slow down folks there would be terrific. Um, so but I'm really excited about this, Director Lascalia. So thank you. And um, and we'll talk about bus stops and where they're going to go some other time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Councilor. Uh, anybody else? OK, uh, this is before us tonight uh, for uh, for approval right now. The request is for approving this tonight. Move uh, approval. Maybe... Second. Okay, uh, motion made by Councillor Foster, seconded by Councillor, was it Bolton, I believe? Okay, and then Councillor Jarrett, what, what do you got? Um, I believe we need to suspend the rules before we can approve it. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, so um, so we will need a motion. So yes, Councillor Foster. I, I might be wrong. Oh, right, because it's first reading. I was using old council rules thinking we had to approve it and then suspend the rules. So forgive me, yes. we have to suspend the rules. Second. Okay, do we need to remove, do you want to withdraw your first motion? Yes. Can we just table it or? Well, I'll withdraw my first motion and instead move to suspend the rules so we can vote on this financial order tonight. I second. Okay, so on the floor is a motion to suspend the rules for sending this off to, um, not sending this to finance uh, or to the consent agenda. It's up for approval this evening. Any discussion on suspending the rule? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Okay, we have suspended our rules for this. We, I will now entertain a motion for approval tonight. Motion for approval. Second. Second. Okay, motion made by Councillor Gore, seconded by Councillor Perry. Any discussion on approval of this tonight? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. Um, item 23.222 in order to appropriate free cash for road safety improvements surrounding NHS has been approved. Next up, item 22.223 in order to appropriate. CPA funds for Connecticut River Greenway multi-use trail 
And I think we're going to have Sarah Lavallee in the room for a little bit. Or maybe it's Carolyn. I don't know. Who do we got? Oh, there she is. Hello, Sarah. Welcome. All right. Can we get her unmuted? Here, let's see if we can do it. You are unmuted, right? I'm allowed to be unmuted. Okay, you're in the room. Okay, great. Thank you. And so this one, I, I'm not going to read because I think it's kind of, I think your description of what's going on is going to pretty much summarize it. Yep. Okay, so, um, so let's see. So let me start with a super quick overview of this round okay. of CPA funding, uh, yeah. and then I'll go into this project. So in, some, in September of this year, the Community Preservation Committee began reviewing project proposals that were submitted for CPA funding consideration um, in this round in, F in fiscal year 2023. And after extensive review, including applicant presentations, site visits, both virtual and finally in-person again, uh, public comment sessions and deliberation, the CPC is uh, voted to recommend the 11 funding requests that are before city council tonight totaling uh, just over $1.2 million. These projects include all eligible CPA project areas, so historic preservation, recreation, affordable housing, as well as open space preservation. And the CPA funding that is being recommended will re leverage more than $7 million in funding from other sources this round. Um, and we do have another round coming up. Uh, second round will be beginning um, in early February. So we definitely encourage you to check out the CPC website. You can see the full application submitted for each project, as well as all sorts of other information. Um, so the Connecticut River Greenway multi-use trail project um, will facilitate design of an accessible multi-use trail that will connect Hatfield, which has no shared use trails, with the Mass Central Rail Trail and the New Haven and New Ham Northampton Canal Greenway. This will provide what will soon be a continuous link from Boston to Northampton, and down to New Haven, and that will serve both Hatfield and one of the most beautiful sections of the Connecticut River. You know, you it, it's really underutilized. You you can't see it unless you're in the passenger seat of a car and you look right going north on 91 just at the right time. But this will open that up to everybody. Um, so CPA funds will be used as a local match for an already received Mass Trails grant, and the terminus in Hatfield is still to be finalized through that community. But even if Hatfield is not ready at this point, the CPC agreed that this section alone will be a destination trail and is worthwhile to proceed with. Okay, questions, counselors? Okay, uh, I have a quick question, Sarah. So it this will be running from essentially, this is an extension of a trail from where the the boat launches, or is this along the the river between the the boat launch and the bridge? So this will um, connect the boat launch area uh, that was recently developed. So you go past River Run um, boat area on the right. So from that area north along the Connecticut River. Okay, thank you. Okay, counselors. Um, this is a financial order and we can uh, choose to send it to uh, the consent agenda or we can send it to finance. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to move this to the consent agenda. Second. Yes, thank you. <laughs> motion made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Jarrett to um, have this item appear on our, the consent agenda of our next meeting. Any discussion on that? Hearing none, uh, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Gore. Yes. Okay. Uh, item 22.223 in order to appropriate CPA funds for Connecticut River Greenway multi use trail will appear on the consent agenda of our next meeting. Next up is item, um, here we go. 
Item 23.224, in order to appropriate CPA funds for DAR house electrical upgrade. Um, okay, Sarah. All right, um, so the 1700s DAR house on South Street, which is also known as the Clap House, is a, just a really outstanding example of a Connecticut River colonial dwelling. At a site visit, the CPC members were able to see firsthand the extent of the antique wiring and the issues presented by the, this remaining knob and tube in the house. The wiring is no longer allowed by code, it has to come out, and its replacement is necessary to allow for insulation and energy efficiency upgrades and use of the, the building for public programming. Uh, and this was something that um, was initially planned to be a, a fairly small a request from CPA just for the materials. DAR was planning to work with Smith Vocational on this project, but unfortunately they weren't able to do that because of COVID restrictions. So they came in for the full amount, but the, the committee agreed that that was something that was worthwhile. Great. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yes, um, that house is just an absolutely beautiful home. Sarah, when was the last time any renovation has been done on that historical home? Uh, overall renovation, I, I don't know. That would be a question for the DAR. Um, using CPA, they they only did some really minor stuff maybe about yeah. 12 years ago. Um, I, it, I think it was about a $20,000 allocation for some exterior work. Because yeah. I, I don't recall with my terms as a city councilor, them coming forth, but they could have, I'm not sure. Yeah, it was 15 years ago in, anyway, so right at the start of CPA, and it was a, a very small request. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to move this to the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Um... So motion made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Moulton. Councillor Jarrett, your hand was raised before all of the, those motions went on. It's fine. <laughs> um, so I was curious, uh, is there any public access to the property? Like, are there events there or tours or, or is this a private home now? Uh, so there are events and tours. Um, DAR is trying to figure out how better to engage with the community, especially after COVID when they, they weren't able to have the, the programming and open houses that they typically were able to. Um, but they do have at, at least monthly events that are open to the general public. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, we have a motion on the floor to send this to the consent agenda. Any more discussion on that? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Moulton. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Perry. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Gore. Yes. And Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, item 23.224, in order to appropriate CPA funds for DAR house electrical upgrade will appear on the consent agenda of our next meeting. Next up is item 23.225, in order to appropriate CPA funds to downtown affordable housing creation project. Um, where is the Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for the Downtown Affordable Housing Creation Project CPA fund, whereas CPA funds will be used to, to advance designs for climate resilient housing uh, in a central downtown location, whereas CPA funds will be used as a match for an already received 921 and 300 dollars of municipal vulnerability program grant, whereas on December 7, 2022, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $60,000 in CPA funds be used for this project. Okay, so it's asking us to do 60, uh, appropriate $60,000. Sarah. Uh, so 
at its heart, this is a very small local match for a very large state grant award. Um, and it will allow further development of designs for affordable housing on a city owned parcel on Crafts Avenue. Um, some of you may remember the council approved the overall project and the disposition of the property back in October, 2021. Um, and the project includes 24 units of climate resilient studio apartments that will be located in the heart of downtown near all services and transit pulse points and close to opportunities for carbon neutral fossil free heating and cooling. And they will also be designed for passive survivability. So the MVP program agreed that this was something that was really important and gave a, you know, a, a pretty substantial grant award. And um, this is the local match for that. Councilor Labarge. Yes, um, Sarah, 24 units. That, that's the initial plan, yeah. What what is the acreage on that property? Oh, I don't. Uh, I would have to look that up. It's um, so essentially this is the lot right behind City Hall. So the the sort of the brutalist concrete stairs. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. And you don't know what the acreage is on that? I can find it. I don't have it handy. Twenty four units. I, I'd like to know the acreage on it, please. I have to get back to you with the exact acreage. Okay. That would be great, Sarah. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? I, I just want to say this is great that we're it we're is. continuing to move forward on this. This is a really yep. uh, great humanitarian effort by the city to make this happen. Yeah, so, we, need, um, we need it. So um, any further discussion? Hearing, uh, so, oh, we need a motion. I'd like oh. to make a motion to move this to the consent agenda. Second. Okay, motion made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Perry. Did I have that right, Laura? This is the first motion? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> There's so many of them. I know. <laughs> All right. Um, any discussion on having this go to the consent agenda? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So, um, Item 23.225, in order to appropriate CPA funds to downtown affordable housing creation project uh, will appear on the consent agenda at our next meeting. Next up is item 23.226, in order to appropriate CPA funds to Leeds affordable housing creation project. And um, Sarah, I'm gonna leave this to you. I'm going to put this in your lap to describe this. Right, sure. Uh, so City Council approved disposition of, of this property as well on Evergreen Road for affordable housing purposes in July 2021. The site was originally about an 8,000 square foot property that was developed in 1914 with a 125,000 gallon water tower. And then in 1945, the northern 3,000 square feet of the site was sold off and became a property, became a part of the property to the west. The water tower remained operational until 1999 when it was removed. And from 1999 until now, it's remained undeveloped. Um, due to its complicated history and some unknowns about subsurface elements, it, there was a water tower what went with it. We don't quite know because of the when it was put up. Uh, some additional work is necessary to allow it to be transferred development ready to an affordable housing partner. And this recommendation will allow that due diligence work to happen. That's great. Cool. Yep. Um, great. Councilor Mayori. Yeah, Can I was, oh, excuse me. Did I see your hand? Go ahead. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, I was pretty fast about it. Yeah, you, it, was, it was like, and I was watching the agenda here. So go yeah, ahead. I'll do a little bird next. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I just wanted to say I was at the, the community meeting about that property with the then director uh, Fighten. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, we were all, um, and Habitat Humanity uh, a rep was there too. And, 
and there were, you know, they weren't really able to commit because of um, because of questions around, um, you know, I guess some sort of drainage and rocks that were put there to, to have for the bolster the water tower. So it really is necessary, and it's a, but yet it's a very exciting place to put uh, an affordable housing. It would truly be in a, you know a very mixed neighborhood, a very well welcoming neighborhood. Uh, that the, the neighbors did have some concerns, but they were really um, all all very supportive. Um, of the idea of it being affordable housing, um, and it you know it's not just an ideal neighborhood to have um, this kind of you know there's lots of walkability, lots of young kids, and I'm just very excited for um, for this project. So I'm hoping that we'll pass it. Councillor, thank you, Councillor Maori. Councillor Labarge. Yeah, Councillor Maori, how many um, are they single family homes? How yeah. many? How many are yeah. in there? I can't remember. I believe just one. There was some talk of could you put two, but I believe um, you know it, it's a pretty small space. Yeah. Um, so it, part of it is around this excavation and seeing what the foundation would hold. Uh, so not probably not more than two. Wow. That's a perfect spot, and I'm happy to see that happening. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? for Sarah. Any motions? I'll move that we send it to the consent agenda. Second. Second. Motion made by Councillor Moulton, seconded by Councillor Jarrett to send this to the consent agenda. Uh, any further discussion on that motion? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. Okay, that item uh, will 23.226 in order to appropriate CPA funds to Leeds affordable housing creation project will appear on our next agenda. Next up oh, on, under the consent agenda, uh, item 23.227 in order to appropriate CPA funds for exterior, exterior structural rehab, rehabilitation of NCMC. Um, Sarah, you want to describe this? Sure. So, uh, so some of you may remember that a, a historic building assessment for 51 Main Street was first funded through the CPA several years ago. Yep. Um, and that I identified and outlined necessary work to secure the building envelope. And then in 2020, CPA funds were awarded for facade repairs, and that was matched by a state um, uh, preservation projects fund grant. And this recommendation will allow that important exterior work to continue. Um, and this one is a partial award recommendation. The CPC didn't, didn't recommend full funding of the application submitted by Smith Charities. This includes only the highest priority items and it included feedback that alternate funding sources for work to this important building should be investigated further by Smith Charities. Okay. Councillor Labarge. Yes, um, I can recall when Mary Claire Higgins was our mayor and I worked as a counselor under her and great support with her for um, the Northampton Community Music Center. And also with our previous mayor, David Narkowitz. They, I, I can tell you right now, they worked very closely with the city and they're respectful. I have residents on my ward with their children who go there. I'm going to support this. This, this, they are excellent. And I just realized I flipped my presentation. My apologies. So let me tell you about the music center. Uh -huh. uh, so <laughs> uh, so the, the CPC was incredibly impressed by the amount and diversity of public support for the community music center project, as well as accompanying stories of how NCMC and its programs were really life-changing in a meaningful way. You know, they, they yes. heard time and time again how um, 
you know, especially during COVID or for people who were feeling isolated, they were able to go there and connect, um, you know, and they became, really gave their lives meaning. And it, it just it was sort of, it was never ending. They were really floored. Uh, so this work will help to preserve the structure, which was a neighborhood school prior to being surplus by the city. And it will also allow NCMC to use it more effectively for its current purpose as a music center. And also, which is great, it will allow for placement of a 30 year historic preservation restriction on the building um, to be administered by the historical commission, which was something that was talked about a little bit when the building was surplus, but, um, but wasn't able to be put in place. So that will provide some additional protection both on the CPA funds and the, the building envelope itself. Great cause. <laughs> Okay. Any discussion on this CPA appropriation for the music school? Councillor Perry. Not much of a discussion, but I also wanna say that the Northampton Community Music School uh, is excellent. It's a couple of Frisbee throws for my house. <laughs> um, one of my daughters is, is taking lessons there. It's excellent. And I'm really excited to support this. So I'll make a motion to move this to the consent agenda. Second. Okay, motion made by Councillor Perry, seconded by Councillor Moulton to have this item appear on our net, the, on the consent agenda at our next meeting. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Moulton. Yes. Okay. Uh, item 23.227, in order to appropriate CPA funds for exterior structural rehabilitation of NCMC will appear on the consent agenda at our next meeting. How's everybody doing? Great. Yeah, all right, good. Uh, item 23.228, in order to appropriate CPA funds for exterior structural rehab of Smith Charities building. And Sarah, is this the one you kind of spoke that, about? That is, yes. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I was looking at the wrong order. So if you if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer those. Oh, uh, Councillor Moulton, then Councillor Jarrett, and then Councillor Labarge. Yep. Thank you. So this uh, one, Sarah, is the one that you said was a partial award, correct? Correct. And that the CPC su suggested that uh, Smith Charity seek alternate funds for the rest of the project. Is is the project such that they can proceed with with part of the repairs with this amount, or do they have to is this going to depend on other funding sources to come together to, to to do the project at all? So Smith Charities was looking at a preservation projects fund grant from the state. Um, it's an incredibly competitive program and the, the awards max out at about 50,000. So it, it wouldn't be able to fund the entirety of the project. Um, but you know, looking at the budget and the estimate, the, the CPC selected those highest priority items that were also the ones that included scaffolding. So that was sort of a, a natural place to draw the line and, and say, you know, the, there's a, a, here's an opportunity to, um, to separate these out and to do this work and maybe think about doing the rest of it later with some other funding. Okay, thanks. Uh, who did I say was gonna be next? Councillor Jarrett and yeah. then Councillor right. Labarge. Well, yeah, um, so I'm not sure if, if everyone knows what the Smith Charities do. Yeah, we know. Um, and that might be worth, uh, I don't know if you could just give a brief description. It, it has to do with our uh, the Oliver Smith will, which we elect uh, someone from Northampton to help manage that. Uh, do Could you just give a brief description, Sarah? Yeah, I'm trying to um, locate the description of them. 
in their application, but um, so they promote quality of life for Northampton residents through its continual continued charitable mission that was established through the Oliver, will of Oliver Smith back in 1845. Uh, Northampton does have an elector to that will. So they support uh, you know, widows and tradespeople. They offer mortgages. Um, and they, they offer grants to nurses, high school graduates, um, people getting married. And they their hands are a little bit tied by the will of Oliver Smith and how it's set up. They're not really able to spend an amount of money that would be appropriate in today's terms for maintenance and ongoing repairs of the structure. And that's something the CPC took into account when, when making the recommendation. And um, I know, you know, I've passed by this building um, on, on Main Street. Um, is there ever an opportunity where people can get to see inside and, and get a tour? I, I don't know. Um, I mean, it, it technically sort of is open to the public, but most people just don't have a, a reason or a need to visit the building. It, it's quirky and, and interesting. It's definitely not accessible in any way. Um, it, it does have stairs everywhere. It has a sort of a big, strange vault in the middle of it, which is one of the complications for adaptive reuse of it and, um, you know, potential sale of the, the structure and one of the reasons why Smith Charities is still there. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure they would be happy to, to offer anyone who reached out a, a tour of the building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Councillor Labarge. Yeah, that was one of my questions about being asked if we could tour that area. I've never been in there. I don't even know what it looks like. And every time I go by, I don't see anybody going in there. I yeah, I, other than than reaching out to Smith Charities, I'm I'm not sure what the what a good answer to that is. I mean, it it's not a very friendly public space, but uh, the yeah. items that were recommended for funding by the CPC are really those critical to the exterior health of the building. Now, who came in to speak? Uh, so that was several of the the Smith trustees, so the electors of the will. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any thoughts on what we might want to do with this? Make a motion to move to the consent agenda. And I'll second it. Okay, Counts, uh, motion made by Councillor Mayori and seconded by Councillor Labarge to send this item to the consent agenda. Um, any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay. Uh, item 23.228, in order to appropriate CPA funds for exterior structural rehabilitation of Smith Charities building will appear on our next consent agenda. Next up. Item 23.229, in order to appropriate CPA funds for Rocky Hill Greenway multi-use trail. And um, Sarah, you wanna fill us in on this? Sure, uh, so partially using CPA funding, the city engaged a consultant several years ago to complete design to about the 25% level, as well as secure all necessary environmental permits. Um, and these documents help to secure 3.6 million in federal funding for the actual trail construction. So CPA funds are now being requested to engage an engineering consultant to finalize and update the plans to include some um, state and federal design requirement changes that have been made since the initial designs were completed. Um, and to review bids and oversee construction. So this is a relatively small investment of city funds that will be able to fully complete the trail to a ribbon cutting 
Um, and it only represents those costs that are not eligible under the federal funding for construction. Uh, Councillor Foster. Thanks for that. And I just wanted to make sure that I'm understanding exactly where this is. Is this where there's um, the small parking in the gate in the dirt path that goes um, past, it looks like the facility to, to control the, the gas pipeline, and then it connects off with the one Northampton Trail? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So this project will allow the just what's really an informal trail now to extend past there uh, all the way to the bike path. Yeah, that's a that's a really um, important segment of path, um, because then from there is that little jog over to Ice Pond um, and to get back into those neighborhoods. So that's that's an exciting project. Wow. OK. Any question? Any more further questions, counselors? I will entertain a motion. Yep, I'd like to make a motion to um, send us to the cassette agenda. Second. Motion made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Perry to have this item appear on our the consent agenda at our next meeting. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay. Item 23.229, in order to appropriate CPA funds for Rocky Hill Greenway multi-use trail, will appear on the consent agenda of our next meeting. Next up, item 23.230, in order to appropriate CPA funds for Habitat for Humanity affordable housing on Burt's Pitts Road. Um, let's see if there's... Um, I'll do a little reading. Whereas Pioneer Valley Habitat for, Habitat for Humanity submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for creation of three energy efficient affordable homes on Burt's Pit Road. Whereas Habitat for Humanity has an excellent record of creating housing throughout the Pioneer Valley and beyond. And the project has a wide community support leveraging funding from other sources and utilizes volunteer labor. Whereas the homes will be permanently restricted to individuals and families earning 60% of area median income or below. Whereas on December 7th, 2022, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $180,000 in community preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Um, all right, Sarah, now you're up. All right, uh, so this parcel contained a, a very dilapidated house that was vacant for many years uh, that was formerly part of the state hospital complex. Yeah. Using the CPA affordable housing fund as well as com some community development block grant funding, the structure was able to be demolished and permitting was able to be completed for the um, upcoming Habitat for, for Humanity project. And the, the uh, order that's before you will allow Habitat to construct three new ownership units. Um, you know, I heard in public comment, people speak eloquently about the importance of these Habitat ownership units, you know, how creative and critical their model is. And um, you know, the, as always, the CPC was enthusiastically supportive of this project. Councillor Labarge. Yeah. Um, Sarah, on these three energy um, affordable homes that they're building, are they, I'm kind of concerned because I have it on Perth's Burt Road, is it gonna be a one bedroom, two bedroom and a three bedroom? Um, let me, I'm not sure if they you mentioned that plan. in their application. Um, that, that's something I can absolutely find out for you. Uh, you know, they, they have been overall looking at a mix of different unit sizes because there are different needs for ownership, but I, I don't have handy 
uh, what, the, what on, the bedroom mix is for these. Right, because ours on Pertzbert Road that they're building is a one um, one bedroom, a two bedroom, and a three bedroom. I think this is great. You're looking something up, Sarah. Yeah, I'm trying to get the, the bedroom mix. Um, so the sizes are, you know, they're they're pretty small between 1,200 and uh, 1,350 square feet. Um, one will be completely adaptable for someone with mobility impairments, and all will meet the standards to be visitable visitable by persons with mobility impairments. Um, That's all right. I was just curious because we had meetings on Pertzbert Road for the houses that were going to be um, placed in Ward 6. And they actually had and told us one bedroom, two, and a three. So and we saw the plans of what they so, were. Uh, these are intended to be uh, each three bedrooms. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Sarah? Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Yes, I'd like to move this to the consent agenda. Second. Motion made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Foster to have this item appear on the consent agenda at our next meeting. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, roll call please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Okay, item 23.230, an order to appropriate CPA funds for Habitat for Humanity Affordable Housing on Burt's Pitts Road will appear on the consent, consent agenda at our next meeting. Next up, item 23.231, in order to appropriate CPA funds to acquire 229 acres in the Sawmill Hills. And... Sarah, I'm going to let you do this one. <laughs> All right. Um... So City Council approved the planned acquisition of the, this really amazing 229 acre section of the wow. Solomon Hills last year. Uh, the city has an option to purchase this property for $690,000 uh, and the Office of Planning and Sustainability and Conservation Commission successfully applied for a state local acquisitions for natural diversity grant for $400,000 um, this fiscal year and that's, that's the maximum award. Um, and this request is the local funding that will complete the funding picture and be able to finalize permanent protection. Um, you know, the surplus will, will be used for in surveys and signage and required soft costs. Um, and, and this area is really a sizable gap in the greenway and public ownership will create a multitude of trail opportunities and protect some really critical habitat as well. Councilor Labarge. Yes, Sarah, who are we purchasing this property from? Uh, the, the Pomeroy family, Barbara Pomeroy. Barbara who? Pomeroy. Okay. Now, in the Sawmill Hill areas, just about where are we talking about? Off by Sylvester Road further down? Uh, so... If, if people know where the Mineral Hills Winery is, the I entrance to this is. property is, is, yeah, yeah, is directly right. across the street from there. Um, right across. And, and it extends, you know, north to the Jeep Eater parcel and south to other protected land within the Sawmill Hills right. uh, and, and east almost all the way to Spring Street. So th gotcha. this is just a, a huge and critical. Beautiful. Thing. I believe it's the largest remaining privately owned um, piece of Northampton at this point. Aren't they cutting... Um, lumber over there already they are so they are doing a, a timber cut um you know we we had ecologist Lori Sanders go out and give us some 
you know, some critical ecological components to look at. And she was really impressed with the quality of the timber cut and thought that it would really increase habitat for some rare birds and provide for some understory yeah. species. So it also decreased the uh, overall purchase price of the property um, and uh -huh. lowered it to the point that really made it affordable for the city. The whole area is absolutely beautiful. It is. And now that there, some of those vistas have been cleared, there's some really amazing views as well. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, I believe Councillor Jarrett and then Councillor Mayori. Yeah, just want to say how, what an amazing resource the Sawmill Hills are. One of my favorite walks is to go walk from my place in Florence all the way to a friend's house on Sylvester Road through the hills. And uh, it'll be great to have additional areas, you know, with um, more carbon sequestration, wildlife, public access. Everything. It's quite a win. That's beautiful. <laughs> All right. uh, Councilor Maori. Yeah, I totally agree. <clears throat> I'm very thrilled about this purchase. Um, and I just wanted to um, clarify, I believe, Director Fied, former Director Fiden said this was going to be classified as recreational. Would it be stipulated recreational land, you know, with, with uh, and whatever that brings with it? I, I... All right, so when the city takes ownership, it will be permanently protected, not able to be developed. Um, there are some existing trails on the property that, that aren't technically legal, so we'll be able to open those up to the public. Um, right. I'm not sure if that fully answers your question. Right. I, I guess, right. I, I think what Director Fiden was saying was that it would allow, if you stipulate it recreationally, you could have um, small buildings or things to, to kind of um, usher in more use of the land. And I was just curious about that, but maybe we're not, maybe that's, we're not there yet. Yeah, I and mean, when we, you know, Kestrel Land Trust is our partner, partner in this acquisition, um, has contributed some funds to close the gap and will hold the required conservation restriction as well. And uh -huh. you know, we'll make sure to craft that restriction with them to allow for you know, some appropriate level of, of recreation. So, you know, parking, maybe warming structures, just anything that we might think of in the future. So we don't accidentally close the door on something that Right. It's a balance, you know, it's a balance between, of, of course, protecting the land as well from overuse, but uh, having enough structures in there that people can, you know, it'd be a great place to consider some of our, um, you know, some trails that were more accessible uh, yeah. for those yeah. with disabilities. And yeah, anyway, very exciting. <laughs> okay. Any more questions for Sarah? I will entertain a motion. I move that we send it to the consent agenda. Second it. Motion made by Councillor Moulton, seconded by Councillor LaBarge to have this item appear on the consent agenda at our next meeting. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. That item uh, 23.231 in order to appropriate CPA funds to acquire 20, 229 acres in the Sawmill Hills will appear on the consent agenda at our next meeting. Next up, item 23.232, in order to appropriate CPA funds to the Affordable Housing Fund. Um, Sarah, I think this is, give it a shot. All right. Um, so th this was sort of an experiment. Um, last time it was funded. So we spoke with our affordable housing development partners. So Habitat, Valley CDC, um, community builders and others, and, and really wanted to learn about, you know, what, what's holding you back from being able to develop more affordable housing. And we heard that it's fairly easy to some extent for them to be able to obtain funding for the actual construction. 
but you know, really getting shovel ready, getting a site that <coughs> able to be developed um, to the point of grant applications was was really an impediment for them. So uh, we created this affordable housing fund to be able to complete that due diligence. So you know, whatever it takes, surveys, um, acquisition, permitting, um, infrastructure engineering, environmental site assessments to see if there's any contamination geotechnical borings, septic plans, any of that pre-development activity to allow us to basically turn the keys over um, to an affordable housing partner and allow them to move forward. Um, so that was incredibly successful. You know, we really amped up our production of affordable housing um, directly in response to this affordable housing fund. So we, the, the CPC agreed that this was something that was worthwhile to be funded to move forward additional sites in the future. Answers. All right. Um, well, Sarah, I want to say I, I'm really excited about this, that this seed money project to get this stuff going um, has been so successful. I, I think that's really cool. And, um, and that I, I think we got a lot of bang for the buck out of this, that, um, that, you know, we're, we're not talking huge amounts of money relative to the projects that we're talking that we we hope move forward and um so i i think this is this is really cool that this is successful yes and i'll entertain a motion so moved second Okay. Motion made by Councillor Elkin, seconded by Councillor Jared. Um, and this motion is to send it to the consent agenda. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yes. I'll second that. <laughs> and um, so, and Councillor Foster, your hand is raised. Um, I was going to ask the same question you just asked. I just wanted to, to have for the record that it was going to the consent agenda. Thank yeah, you. it's good to know what our motion is doing. Oh. Okay. <laughs> right. A little too pithy there, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, any further discussion on this item? Uh, this is a vote to send it to the consent agenda. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Perry? Yes. Councillor Elkins? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. And Councillor Gore? Yes. Okay. Item uh, 23.232 in order to appropriate CPA funds to the affordable housing project, uh, housing fund will appear on the consent agenda at our next meeting. Up now is item 23.233 in order to appropriate CPA funds to the conservation fund. And basically I'm looking for pretty language in these to see if I should read it. So, um, but Sarah, I think you, I'm gonna give you a shot at this one too. Sure, uh, so this is you know kind of the same type of project um, as the one that was just discussed, but for conservation and open space projects rather than affordable housing. Uh, so the conservation fund is, is just such an important tool in the Conservation Commission's land protection toolbox. Um, land acquisitions can, they're not always, but sometimes they can be really time sensitive and the time required to obtain council approval of the allocations of funds for each of those individual projects would really kill the deal on a lot of land protection efforts. Uh, so having these funds readily available for you know, whatever comes up uh, for soft costs, appraisals, legal research surveys, uh, environmental site assessments, habitat assessments, you know, anything that comes up, every project is different, um, allows those deals to, to happen. Um, this would be the 14th funding of the conservation fund. Um, it was first established in 2009, but it's allowed um, injection of literally several million dollars in funding opportunities from other funds, thanks to this pretty small uh, in the big picture first dollars in from CPA. Um, so that, you know, that includes eight state local acquisitions for natural diversity grants, like the one that we just talked about for Pomeroy. 
as well as parkland acquisitions and renovations grants, um, federal land and water conservation fund grants for other types of projects, trail development grants, private foundation grants, wetland protection grants, as well as private donations. Um, it's so it, it's, I really can't overstate how critical and important this is to allow the Conservation Commission the flexibility to act when they need it. Thank you. Councilors, any questions? Okay. I'd I'll... like to move this to the consent agenda. Second. <clears throat> Motion made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Moulton to have this item appear on the consent agenda at our next meeting. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Okay. Item 23.233, in order to appropriate CPA funds to the conservation fund will appear on the consent agenda at our next meeting. With that, I'm gonna call for a 10 minute break. Thank I you. think we are about to engage in a little discussion here and uh, yeah, freshen up everybody and uh, look forward to discussion in about 10 minutes. Thank you.
Hmm. Is it 10 minutes? I didn't look at the time. I just, <laughs> I had so much to do. I was like, what are you up yet. <laughs> we still got time. Okay. It was 9.12, but it's now 9.22. So it's been 10 minutes. <laughs> That's it? Yep. Wow. Well, I'm easy. I'll, I'll be looking at the agenda, figuring out <laughs> what we're going to do next here and stuff like that. Oh, Councillor Labarge. Yes. Um, uh, Attorney Seawald is, um, has joined us, and he said that that acreage behind the uh, City Hall is 1.2 acres. Tell him I said thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, he'll be, he's around here if you want to thank him. But thank you. There he is. <laughs> Dang. Hey, Jim. Yeah. That meeting was terrible. I, I'll tell you, I had six residents could not get in at all on that meeting. Yeah, it was, it was not a good platform. No. Usually they had the meeting ID and the passcode. This was altogether something different. My residents yeah. were not happy about that. They talked with me after. <laughs> Well, we can talk more about that. Yep. Um, okay. Looks like Attorney Seawald is trying to get our oh. attention. Oh, he's oh, doing, he muted. Uh, make him a co-host. Thank you, Laura. Okay. There he is. Let's see. Okay. There we go. He's a co-host now. Thank you. That was 0.12 acres, not 1.2 acres. Oh. 0.12, just over a tenth of an acre. Did I say 1.2? <laughs> yeah, that would be an uh, awfully small 1.2. I was going to say, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misread that. Okay. Um, I think it's time to get started here. Next up is ordinances. We have item 22.201, an ordinance limiting the number of retail cannabis establishments in the city of Northampton. This is um, back here for uh, approval, uh, possible approval. Uh, this is referred to, it's been referred to legislative matters on 1215. Uh, legislative matters sent it back with a neutral recommendation on a split vote. Uh, with Councillor Elkins opposed and Councillors Nash, uh, Jarrett, and Moulton in favor of the neutral recommendation. Um, and so that's where we're at right now. Um, for, I think, you know what, I, I'm going to read this into the record just to set the table here. Um, in the City Council, December 15, 2022, upon the recommendation of Councilors Karen Foster, Marianne Labarge, and Rachel Mayori, um, item, uh, this is 22.201, an ordinance, an ordinance limiting the number of retail cannabis establishments in the City of Northampton, whereas the Commissioner of Northampton's Department of Health and Human Services has called for the city to institute an upper limit on the number of retail cannabis establishments in the city and whereas the pursuit of social equity is a core value consistently expressed by both our municipal government and community members. Now, therefore, it be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton in city council assembled as follows. Um, add the following to the code of ordinances section. Um, I guess that we don't know what section that is quite yet. Um, uh, A, in accordance with Mass General Laws, chapter 94G, subsection 3A2, there shall be no more than 12 retail establishments in the city of Northampton the limit shall not apply to marijuana establishments other than those operated by a marijuana retailer, as that term is defined in Mass General Law, Chapter 94G, Subsection 1. Uh, B, the following shall be exempt from the limitations set forth in this ordinance. 
One, ownership applicants who qualify as social equity candidates as defined by the Cannabis Control Commission of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be exempt from this ordinance. Two, this ordin ordinance shall not apply to a retail establishment or a proposed retail establishment for which a lease agreement for a Northampton property has been signed as of the effective date of this ordinance. Okay, that's what's on the table. <clears throat> Councilor Foster. Thanks, Council President. As, as one of the co-sponsors, I'd um, love to have a chance to, to kick off the discussion. And I wanted to start by thanking you all and the community and everybody who's invested so much time and thought into this discussion. Um, this is what democracy looks like. I think this is more divided um, than uh, of an issue than we've had in a while. It can be messy, um, but these kinds of really public discussions and grapplings are necessary. Um, we're all balancing competing priorities. We're receiving input from a broad spectrum of the community. And I know we're all working hard in developing the frameworks um, that we need to, to make the best decisions that we can for our city. That being said, um, something I, I want to make sure doesn't go unaddressed. Um, so I'm 44. I've been in positions of leadership and responsibility for an awful long time. I've been the executive director of an organization since I was 27 years old. Um, and I want to touch on the subtle ways in which women um, are undermined um, professionally and academia um, and out in the community. And I don't think people recognize it. It's subtle. Um, it's things for me at work, like people coming in and wanting to speak to the guy that runs the place. Um, the exact language I hear regularly. Um, asking me a technical question, me answering or giving technical information um, that someone will accept after a male staff member has reaffirmed the information that I just shared. Um, I think that most women could probably go on for days about experiences like that. Um, and it's unintentional, um, but it's so baked in that it happens pretty constantly. And I'm seeing that dynamic play out in this debate. And I wanted to make sure that that does not go unaddressed, that we're looking at the substance of the issue instead. Um, what we've had is eminently qualified women with expertise in public health and data and in research, share their expertise and knowledge with the city council and with the community, the council. They've taken the time to draw parallels to other industries. They've broken down the trends that they're seeing and they've shared the strengths and the limitations of the data they have. Most recently, there's been a lot of discussion about the data shared from SPIFI, um, but I, I wanna make sure that we know that this, this conversation has been going on for months and for months, I've seen um, expertise be undermined, questioned, challenged, and ignored. And that the people that I've seen speak up, and I'm still hearing it even tonight, well, we don't know. We don't know what the data says. It's not clear. I, I heard that uh, in public comment. Um, but our commissioner of the Department of Health and Human Services drew parallels to other industries and spoke strongly in favor um, of limiting the number of cannabis retailers in Northampton. Um, Carolyn Johnson, who holds a PhD and is the public health data and evaluation specialist for SPIFI, has taken the time to walk us through the local data and, again, to put it in context and to share the nuance and what that data means. Um, we've seen Heather Warner, who has a Master of Public Health, the coalition manager for SPIFI, speak in the community resources meeting. And Kara McLaughlin from the Northampton Prevention Coalition, she was the Northampton Prevention Coalition coordinator, also spoke up at our meetings um, to share their expertise and their knowledge with their council. And so I just want to point this out um, to make sure that when we've had somebody, you know, at a meeting say, that's not true, the data doesn't bear this out, but without showing of any evidence or any research, I wanna make sure that doesn't creep into our thought process and into what we're actually discussing here. That being said, there are reasons, really valid reasons, that people will support or grapple with not supporting this ordinance, um, but that's not a matter of the quality of the data that we're looking at. Um, 
you know, I understand that there are economic arguments um, that people have shared against limiting the number of cannabis retail establishments. Um, you know, but again, as I mentioned before, we're looking at a bunch of competing priorities. Mine is the call from the public health specialists in our community and what they've said. Um, I understand that there are strong economic arguments. I understand them. I'm not swayed by them. Um, but, you know, I, I, I get where my colleagues are coming from, and I understand that we're all going to do the work we need to do um, to make the best decisions for our city that we can. And just the last thing that I've also been hearing that I, I want to make sure we address is there's a perception um, that youth can't access cannabis from the dispensaries um, because they can't walk into the dispensaries and get it. But that I just want to be really clear because I've been a young person and I can't be the only one and I know young people. So I'm going to out myself here. I think I'm, I'm old enough to say it. I drank alcohol before I was 21 years old and I was not making my own moonshine. Okay. I had friends. <laughs> <laughs> older friends who went to the liquor store and got it and shared it with those of us who were not 21. Mm -hmm. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility to recognize that um, young people have easier access to cannabis for a whole host of reasons. We're looking at shifting cultural norms, um, the, the information that, that our public health specialists have called out. I'm not gonna rehash all of that right now, but don't mistake that it's, that it's not easier to get. Um, it, it, it is, and the impacts on young people have been shown. Um, so that is where I'm coming from with my co-sponsorship um, of this ordinance. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mayori, and then Councillor Labarge. Just, I really need to thank my co-sponsor. I mean, there's so much power in naming that and giving voice to something that's been building um, throughout this conversation in little ways like eye rolling at professional women um, to the, the, you know, the bigger ways that you mentioned. Um, so thank you for that. It's very brave of you to do that. And I think it's an important um, step for to, to bring awareness to it. Thank you. Uh, you know, we've been having this conversation for a while. Uh, you know, I think um, we've already established many of the reasons. I'm not going to rehash all of them, but I just want to touch upon and kind of recenter. You know why why I'm you know I I'm a sponsor of this ordinance. Um, as Councillor Foster has said, you know Northampton's health commissioner and our public health leaders have asked for a cap because of the growing concern about the correlation between the number of cannabis retail establishments and uh, youth cannabis use. You know, and I grew up in the Nancy Reagan era um, where we, we we watched whole whole neighborhoods being decimated by the war on drugs. That was my first public health research um, paper and internship was uh, documenting and, and and the decimation of the war on drugs, not only in the U.S. but in I, I was I was documented in Colombia and and abroad. It was a terrible it was a terrible racist policy. Uh, I don't think any of us want to go back there. And I understand why people are triggered by that and, and hold that fear. Uh, I don't think any of us want to stigmatize or I certainly don't stigmatize or demonize cannabis. I certainly think that you know, alcohol and cigarettes play out in our society in much, you know, much more profound and negative impacts. So let's just get that out there. But I feel I feel that I feel that concern from people and I, I hear it. I think it's actually, I mean, legalization is social progress. And I think this whole conversation is here because of progress. I think it's okay to have this now, to have the nuance and hold the nuances. Um, so, you know, that, there are, of course, um, you know, many benefits and promising treatments involving cannabis. And I and I've said before that my my big concern is that North um, Northampton residents and, and visitors have um, you know reasonable access to their legal right to legally purchase cannabis. And I feel like we've achieved that in Northampton. That we've been welcoming and we've allowed that. And I'm glad for it. I'm glad for the businesses we've had, and I'm glad for that message. Um, you know, I. I so I think we can hold the nuance that while there's benefits, we are seeing this statistically significant correlational data. And I, I guess, you know, I, I want to say I don't understand why we would just disregard it, but I think Councillor um, Foster has spoken to, partly to why. 
Um, and, you know, I appreciate some of the, the you know, the points that got brought up in the Legislative Matters Subcommittee. Uh, I appreciate Councilor Nash, you know, you wanting all cannabis to come through regulated channels. Uh, however, you know, with the astronomical cost of entry into the cannabis industry, there is only so low cannabis retail prices are going to go. Uh, we, we've been, you know, uh, we're talking about a weed that can grow in your backyard, um, you know, which mm -hmm. folks have been doing for years and years and years. I'm afraid no amount of cannabis retail establishments will get rid of the unregulated, unregulated market. Um, and I, I'm very, you know, disturbed by the notion that we need to keep opening more and more establishments or our youth will be exposed to crime. Um, I also want to state that the unregulated market, you know, it, you know, there are criminal elements and then there are, as I said, people growing, you know, weed in their backyard. So um, but I, I just, I was very disturbed by that, that idea that was put forth that we need, need to just keep you know, opening these stores and hoping that everything will be regulated. At this point, that's not going to happen with the cost of entry. Uh, and so the same with kind of let the market decide, let the free market decide. I, I don't think there's much free with this market. It's an extremely elite market. Um, it's not, there's nothing really natural about it. Um, it's steeped in inequity. Uh, so I just think it's, we, we shouldn't pass the buck here. You know, as I said before, the market isn't an elected representative. Um, like restricting plastics, which we did last year and other, you know, subsidized housing. We don't, we, we step in with, with the market. We don't just feed our community to the market and without thought. Um, I hear the concerns about social equity candidates being able to sell their licenses. Um, I guess I would say is our current system, which is doing zero uh, about social equity better. Uh, at least resources have a better chance of passing through the hands of social equity business owners. Um, as we stated before, you know, we have one social equity business owner in Northampton out of 12, uh, 12 businesses, of, soon to be 11 and 14 HDAs. So, you know, I will name, we all know it, it's quite late in the game to be having this conversation to be trying to come up with the ideal number of pot shops or, or to be addressing social inequity in, in cannabis, cannabis business ownership. But here, here we are. Um, so let's just, I, I really beg to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, so, you know, the, the process of, of, of opening cannabis businesses is inordinately long um, from start to finish. And so, you know, it, it, I understand the idea of, of licenses being, um, the concern about licenses being overinflated. Uh, there's also, you know, it's hard to overvalue when they've been losing so much value each year. I did call a couple of other municipalities and so many municipalities have caps. Uh, I didn't hear that concern. I, I talked to East Hampton as well. You know, what they're saying is, you know, the, the inflation and the social inequity has a lot to do with hyper-regulation and, um, and the way things are regulated at the state level. So uh, I think that's, I'm glad that the, um, Cannabis Commission is kind of reviewing their, their laws and the rules, and I'm hoping that we can have some progress on that. Uh, so, um, you know, I think, I, I guess I get back to, you know, why not have a reasonable cap? That what's, that's what we've been talking about. Um, I don't really see how we can deny that there are legitimate concerns about the unintended consequences of the intense saturation of cannabis retail on our you know, on our young residents and, um, and there are reasonable concerns about the glaring lack of social equity, uh, you know, one of our shining community values um, in the cannabis business establishments. So uh, I also don't really see anywhere else that um, where um, these two issues are being addressed except in this ordinance. So we as a council, you know, and as a community have to decide what our priorities are. There's, you know, there's, yes, there's um, cons and pros and cons. Um, and so it's time for us to state our priorities, you know, as, as our stack of home rule petitions can attest to, the state of Massachusetts does not give municipalities powers lightly. You know, they have given us this one. Most municipalities have taken them up on it. This is no overreach. 
This is showing up and taking responsibility for the direction of our community development. It is incumbent upon us to be in the driver's seat as we balance business interests, tax revenue, our local culture, our community social equity values and goals, and the health of our young people, our next generation. So it is in this spirit that we submit this ordinance to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Labarge. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, and I want to, first of all, I want to thank my sponsors, Vice President Karen Foster, Councillor of Ward 2, and Councillor Rachel Mayor, Councillor from Ward 7, for the three of us working tirelessly together to get the information we needed to have a good ordinance in place of why a cap needs to be placed in our city of Northampton. I also want to thank our city solicitor, attorney Alan Seawald, for guiding us in making sure we have the correct language to place in our ordinance. A lot of research has been done, believe me. Between the three of us counselors, we have not just been sitting back, we've been reaching out, reaching out. And a lot of the research that has been done was working with Carolyn Johnson, the PhD, Data and Evaluation Specialist, Department of Health, Families and Communities, Collaborative for Educational Services. Our Board of Health Commissioner, Meredith O'Leary, who came forth at one of our committee meetings and stated the reasons why she felt it was time to place a cap in our city now. In 2000, I mean, in 2018, she said it should have been done then too. But now she is saying to cap. I also want to thank the counselors and the residents in the city of the departments that have been helping us out. And there has been some discrepancies and in information that was sent to us counselors. And I have to say, the email that received from an expert on the no vote on capping, I found his report not to have the research to back some of his questions. I find that Carolyn Johnson's research has been right to the point of the heavier use among teens. Northampton and countywide rates, rates over time Five charts she presented to all of us counselors with excellent information. We had many opportunities to talk to her and she explained with great knowledge of understanding the five charts. Carolyn Johnson again sent us recently another breakdown, two more charts, breakdown of teens who reporting using cannabis in the past 30 days of both charts. I talked with her two times and she fully went through the percentages with me. I asked anti-cappers how they understand the difference between the Northampton adolescent marijuana use rates and the national rates. That I have not heard. It appears that the effort to block the ordinance which some people are also talking to you about and how they feel is not just an argument for letting the free market take care of things. And I agree with that. It looks more like interested parties just want to protect their ability to amass wealth through the legalization of cannabis and by saturating Northampton with shops on every corner or where it's zoned. And many people have been saying that. I have heard from many people who live in this city about the amount of shops happening in our city for the past year and a half or so. Too many shops, something needs to be done, counselor. We need a cap. They're not happy, believe me. Counselors in this city are not happy. Some have even approached me lately. If it didn't pass, whatever that they would look at placing it on the ballot. Slowly the growth of the marijuana shops is in service 
to so many people in our city. As city councilors, we are not anti-business. We have a job and we have heard from so many people to place a car, a cap. And that's important to me. When somebody talks to me and tells me of how they feel and what is happening with our community, I take that very, very serious. And I know my mayor does too. An alternative for our mayor or any mayor would be to protect the diversity of types of businesses and industries in our small city. Anybody who studies urban development can tell any mayor that developing any size town or city around one industry is a recipe for disaster. That creates too many jobs in just one industry than when they can't compete because there are too many. Where did they go? South. That has happened here right in New England. It has happened in East Stampton. It's happening in Northampton. Something needs to be done here. So what is our, our community development? What is healthy in our community development is encouraging many kinds of industries to locate. As a counselor, it is our responsibility to create a policy that takes all of these varied factors into account. We need to balance the benefits of cannabis legislation with public health and equity. And that's where the value is for every family, every child, every youth in our city of Northampton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. You're welcome. All right. <coughs> Councillor Jared. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the three sponsors um, for the many points you raised. Really appreciate that and your courage. Um, I just have first a, a couple of uh, technical or legal questions. I wonder if attorney Seawald might be able to address. Um, so a host community agreement, is there a time limit? Like how long do they last if, if no store is opened? Generally they're five-year agreements. So by statute. And so um, I, uh, the HCAs that I draft commence when the operation commences. So five years from when the operation commences. And, you know, as you probably know, many of the HCAs that were out there for, were out there for many years before um, the license issued and the, and the dispensary opened. Uh, so it does take a while, but that's the way I've written them. Okay, so the, for the ones that we have signed agreements, but there is no, but no store has opened. There is essentially no time limit. They they won't they won't expire. They won't expire, and they can't expire because they need an ACA to operate. So, um, so but they Sorry, they an ACA HCA. Oh, they HCA. need an ACA to operate. So, um, and they last for five years, and then we have to renegotiate. And so the host community fees, if they're collected, are are five year fees. And are the host community agreements are only to one per, to a particular location? Yes, so, to a particular operator and a particular location. Okay, so the, they do have to, to continue to maintain the a lease agreement or some with that particular property. So that there is an incentive to, to I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, how, how much are we legacying uh, or grandfathering, I think legacying is um, the, the existing one. So that, thank you for that. Um, if I may also just add that the license are uh, license process is specific to a location because you know the CCC does quite a bit of you know investigation and vetting of the location for security purposes and things like that. Okay, great. Um, and then the let's see. So we we in the stipulation of um, let's see. So it's B two in the in the ordinance, the ordinance shall not apply to a retail establishment or proposed retail establishment for which a lease agreement for a Northampton property has been signed. Um, all that's required 
my interpretation of that is all that's required to maintain that exception is to continue, is to have a lease and for that lease to um, to still the, that agreement to be signed. Um, there's no time limit in that case between. No, there's not. Right. Okay. Not the way it's written now. Correct. Right. So I'll just um, we throw out there now, and we can discuss this later as possible amendment, but. Uh, to add something like, and a host community agreement is signed within one year of the effective date of this ordinance, something like that would would put a, a time limit on that. Um, well, we can talk, talk, I'm not proposing that ordinance, or, uh, that amendment right now, so, but I just wanted to uh, talk, talk that out. Um, and then my last question is, kind of, can you give us your best interpretation knowing the uncertainties of cannabis law at this point of, of B1, um, the owner applicants who qualify as social equity candidates? Mm -hmm. um, can you just speak to, to that as the language is currently written? Um, I don't have it in front of me, but um, the, uh, are, you, are, you, are you asking about generally about social, how the social equity process functions or right. so so social equity can, uh, applicants are applicants who who uh, have been involved with um, the uh, illegal has been have been victimized by the illegal can illegality of cannabis over the years and there are other programs for women and minorities um, so uh, but the social, but these are programs at the CCC. So what that means is the CCC will offer technical assistance and expedited review of the application, but there's no social equity license. It is a license like any other license that's issued for a, um, a dispensary. And it has all of this, you know, the attributes of a, of a general license. It's just the process at CCC that is affected by the status as social equity. Right, so I guess what I'm trying to get at is how will this particular um, line in the ordinance affect a social equity can affect a license that no longer belongs to a social equity candidate because they have sold it. They're, they're, you know, there's no restriction on them selling it, but then they would not be an owner applicant who would qualify as a social equity candidate at that point. But there's no social equity candidates in the, in the city. The social equity applicants are at the CCC and um, you've granted an HCA and the CCC has granted a license. It's in perpetuity. Okay. So that, that's, I mean, it, it needs to be reviewed and renewed every year, but it's a license. It's a licensed premises. We have an HCA. They've changed their position. We can't undo the HCA. Uh, it's a contract. And so, um, you know, once the social equity applicant at CCC is issued a license and opens in Northampton, they're like any other dispensary. Okay. Thank you for those clarifications. <laughs> Okay. Councillor Foster. Yeah, I, I I don't need to do this now. Um, we do have an amendment that we can propose that we we ran language by Solicitor Seawald to help clarify the second section of the ordinance, um, and I'm I'm happy to share that now or have the bigger picture discussion and and then get into the weeds, Councilor Jarrett, just because you had alluded to an amendment as well. Um, do you have a preference there, Council President? Um, no, we can, you can, we can do this. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, now. Um, I'm a very visual person. Do you mind if I, I'd like to screen share just so that um, people have a chance to read it and not just listen yes, to it. Thank okay. you. Great. Um, Okay. Um, can you see that okay? All right, it's funny for me. All right. Um, this ordinance shall not apply to a retail establishment or a proposed retail establishment with either a host community agreement executed by the mayor 
as of January 19th, 2023, that's today, an establishment or a proposed establishment that has a signed lease agreement or has purchased property for an establishment as of January 19th, 2023. The establishment shall produce such documentation of the lease or purchase as is requested by the city to establish the lease or purchase of such property that came out of our discussion at the last meeting about how are we going to prove this. Um, and then uh, to an HCA executed after January 19th, 2023, solely for delivery or courier of cannabis products other than delivery to the consumer over the counter at a retail cannabis establishment. Um, and so what what that's doing is making sure that this isn't inadvertently applying to delivery. Um, and uh, when I asked Solicitor Seawald about on-site consumption, um, that doesn't qualify as retail cannabis. So this is that that last line is just an extra clarification about that piece. But it's the sort of technicality of how are we going to show somebody's already in the process of, has leased or, or purchased property. So, Councillor, to, to be clear, so you're proposing to change out what's in the ordinance right now for, I guess, for B? Yes. And yeah, to clarify that, it, it was not as clear about um, the exemption for people already through the process. Right. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, with the screen, like, I see... Uh, Councillor Jarrett and Councillor Elkins. Uh, let's do uh, Councillor Elkins first. Um, uh, so first of all, thank you, Councillor Foster. Um, I, I know I was the one who specifically had the questions about the lease provision. Um, I, I have to say, I, I guess I'm still wondering that um, it, um, the way it's written, it looks to me that if somebody has a signed lease of any kind of property, let's say whoever owns strata or whoever is running strata or whoever's running any other establishment uh, is would that qualify how do i mean I, I i'm having a hard time seeing how that would not be grandfathered in if, if if a proprietor of one kind of business holds the lease um and has an existing lease as of today um how would it seems to me that if tomorrow they decided um to uh even though they didn't have a, uh, an HCA established and, and uh, they weren't an equity candidate, uh, they show that they had a lease signed as of today. Um, it does not. It does not seem to exclude that there is a, a sp sort of specific business plan in place that this is a um, that this be a cannabis and a business. Um, and and I will I'll be candid and to say that that I am I'm really concerned that we have a number of vacant storefronts, as many people have pointed out. Um, you know, controlled by a limited number of landlords, and we don't know who they're collecting rent from. And I and I do actually think that uh, that you know there is some. Uh, I, I I'm just saying there there is an opening there for somebody who owns a coffee shop to decide I want to go into cannabis and I'm going to use my existing lease um, to do it. So I I in general I I'm I'm. I am uh, I'm concerned that we have a limited amount of information about who this provision is going to benefit and that it has come, frankly, at the request of a very, you know, limited sort of uh, commercial interest. Um, and I'm not at all, I don't, I, you know, frankly, I would just omit that. I think we, there's a, a an external licensing, um, you know, process that, we can rely on an attorney, an attorney Sewell said uh, that it would be simpler and it seems very clean to me. I just, uh, and, and I, and I, and I, and I kind of raised the prospect at the last, uh, at the legislative matters meeting of the possibility of somebody might be dishonest or whatever, but you wouldn't have to be dishonest to take your coffee shop and change it to a, a cannabis uh, dispensary. If you were willing to go through all those ho hoops and, and now we have this signed lease provision. So I, uh, all things being equal, notwithstanding other positions I've, I've stated, uh, um, if this were to go, in, uh, if this is to pass, um, I would eliminate, I would suggest eliminating the lease provision entirely. Councillor Jarrett? Yes, I, I had similar concerns and I, that I 
would would suggest it would be much cleaner to to simply have it as an HCA. But um, I also didn't understand, I guess, provision two. If that could you bring that up on the screen again? Um, Which of, of, of the amendment of Councillor Foster's amendment? Okay, great. Um, Councillor Foster. There it is. Okay. Um, that one, an establishment, a proposed establishment that has a signed lease agreement or has purchased property for an establishment as of January 19th, 2023. The establishment shall produce such documentation of the lease or purchase as is requested by the city to establish the lease or purchase of such property. Very legalese. Oh, yeah. So I guess I just didn't understand the last bit to establish the lease or purchase of such property. Oh, I see. The, to produce to such documentation of the, <laughs> the documentation is is to establish the lease or purchase of stuff. It just seems du duplicative, but I, I guess I understand it now. So and that, it, that that's the legal language it needs to happen. Yeah. And if I, could, if I could just add one more, this really dramatically um, privileges property owners. Somebody's owned it from 1963 a piece of property since 1963 can do whatever they want to and point to like I bought it in 1963 and now I want to run a cannabis shop I, I just don't see an exclusion from this um I I'm sorry Councilor May I and I I'm just I can't I, I can't I'm not mayor I cancel mayor and just because you look uh like you're uh 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 have a I'm just wondering, it seems like you might have had a response to that, but I don't, I don't know. Well, if somebody wants to raise their hand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Councilor no, I, yours. Yeah, no, I was just, you know, I was just thinking about what you're saying, uh, Councilor Elkins. Yeah, I mean, the, so the spirit of this was we just really want to, you know, we're, we appreciate the businesses that have opened in Northampton. We really wanted to honor those processes. We didn't want this to be unduly punitive to any kind of uh, processes that were, you know, at play. Uh, I that said, um, from my little research, you know, I think there wasn't. I don't think we're talking about a lot of, um, you know, a lot a lot of uh, businesses that are, you know, I, I found one that possibly would qualify. So I, you know, I as a sponsor, I'm my co sponsors have to stay, but I'm certainly open to 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 other. Um, to other avenues but right. yeah the spirit of it was really just wanting to make sure that we honor any any businesses at play because of the huge investment um and we yeah so I, I i'm sorry i didn't mean to put you on the spot i just uh no that's I, okay I, I, unclear, sorry. I, I think i i look i think it's uh, the time of night that my eyes cross so i probably look <laughs> a little you know something but um, no, I think I was just really thinking about what you said. I, I think that's, yeah, I, I really want to keep to the spirit of why we put that in there. And, and I, I'm sure my co-sponsors are, you know, are open to, to other um, avenues for the UMA. Councillor Moulton. Thank you. Um, could, could we get that amendment or possible amendment back on the screen, Councillor Foster? Thank uh, Oh, we lost it. She'll find it. Okay. Oh, well, I I'll, thought it was there. Is it not there? Nope. No. Nope. Oh, what am I sharing then? Hang on. Uh, <laughs> bad. <laughs> some, some photos of yourself. Some, some, <laughs> some folder. Your, um, but anyway, let me, I can speak to, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, now that we have uh, potentially introduced uh, an H an executed HCA as a reason for an exemption, I, like Councillors Elkins and Jarrett, also feel that that is much cleaner in terms of intent. It speaks to the intent to open a, a cannabis business, retail shop. Whereas the other exemption uh, for property holders or leaseholders is an exemption that you can you can drive a, a huge truck through. It really gives anyone who owns property or leases uh, as of today uh, the 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 ability then to decide at some 
undetermined point that they want to open a retail cannabis shop. So I I would prefer to go with uh, with the HCA um, exemption. And then I I don't think that point I think point three uh, bullet three there uh, is actually a, a second or a separate section of the of the or of the exemptions. It would be I, I believe three, number three. This would not apply to any HCA executed after today solely for delivery or courier. Uh, mm -hmm. Right. That's that's my preference. Uh, Councillor Gore. I just had a question about if the sponsors know if if we just put in the clause for an HCA agreement, does that include everybody who's out there basically? Councillor Foster. To my understanding, Councillor Gore and, and Councillor Mary, you're the, you're the one that had the conversation. It will include everybody, but the one we heard of who may have signed a lease agreement with the intent of um, uh, opening a retail establishment. Um, so, But the people who have signed host community agreements with the mayor um, would be exempted. Um, so, so that piece would cover that. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Elkins. Um, I'm and I'm sorry, I keep coming back to this, but who is that person? Who who is the entity or person who has a lease agreement that hasn't acted on uh an HC uh, on an HCA yet? Do, do we know who that person is? I mean, I I know who the request or the 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 who brought to your attention the issue about the sort of lease, but yeah. No, we don't, we, we don't, um, no, and I don't, so I don't think it's many, uh, that was just a concern, but I understand what you're saying about the, because, you know, just because the HCA is the last part of the process. And so we're, we're trying to kind of, you know, yeah. in the spirit of it, uh, but, but I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, no, we don't know more, more than, and that's, and what we ran into is that, you know, as you said, like, how do you, you know, how would you actually get a, you know, a list? How would you really know how many people you're talking about? Um, and so, um, you know, we, we wanted to leave, leave that, put them in, in for, the, for that possibility um, as well. But yes, I think, um, I think maybe Solicitor Seawald had some. Uh, yeah, I saw it. Yeah, Attorney Seawald. Go ahead, Alan. I just want to be clear that an HCA is very early in the process. It's not the late or the last thing in the process. You need an HCA in order to apply for a license. It's part of the application process. So that's very early in the process. Well, in the process, but, but not the time period. I mean, you know, the Euphorium had been there. They've been working on it for three years. I mean, that's that was my impression that there had could, there could have been at least some amount of investment on some level for a couple of years before we got there. That's that's the, that's what I meant by the process. Right. Councillor uh, Jared. Well, um, I I would suggest you know we either say that it is it is simply an HCA or we put in some sort of time provision in the second. Um, in the in the lease, which says an HCA must be signed within this time, which is essentially delaying the implementation date of, of this ordinance. Well, I I'll, I'll just weigh in here around HCAs. I I think that that is the point where somebody makes their intentions known to the city as to whether or not. They're interested in starting a, a, a cannabis business here. I, I equate it kind of like with somebody pulling a permit. 
that they're stating their intention with the city that they're going to do some work on a property or their property. And it, um, yes, uh, somebody may have been thinking of it for a while, um, you know, but um, that I, I think that for in terms of the city, that really is the jump off point and that and I think that should be the um, the criteria for uh, defining uh, when this uh, exemption process might start. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Councilor Mayori. Yeah, I just want to say um, I don't want to speak for my co-sponsors, and I, I would really respect whatever they feel. But I'm personally fine with that. Councillor Labarge. I am also. Third. Great. Um, all right. Um, so it sounds like maybe uh, Councillor Foster wants to suggest something maybe at this point or? Give me, give me just a second. <laughs> I believe we have the original language, which was the HDA. Yes. I mean, I think um, I, I was I was trying to get to my strike through text, but I, I didn't get that. Oh, maybe I can find but it. But if we oh, just, yeah. if, I mean, uh, right, um, this ordinance shall not apply to a retail establishment or a proposed retail establishment. Um, no, that's going to that's going to take a few minutes. Maybe we should carry on with the discussion um, and, and we can yeah, we're, a proposed yeah. amendment, basically um, just exempting an establishment that has a host community agreement, but um, we can get to actual language. Yeah, I'll look too. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so. Councillor Labarge. Yeah. So what I'm reading on there, I don't have it on my paper on that amendment for some reason, well, along with 50 to 60 other papers I have here. Um, Karen, could you please put that back up on that concern right there on that paragraph about the host community agreement? I guess signed is it signed by the mayor oh um I, I I'm gonna I'll work on that but it would say yes a host community agreement signed by the mayor this is changed already um but yeah that was solicitor Seawald recommended that that language of the host right. community agreement right. signed by the mayor that's what I thought okay um, so we have Councillor Foster crafting some language to make an amendment. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I, I think at this point, I, I'll, I want to make some remarks. Um, so, uh, First of all, if I came off as if I was inappropriately um, doing anything to anybody, I want to apologize for that. And people want to speak to me, um, you know, anytime I'm, I'm open to hearing about that. Um, I, um, I, you know, I, I'm happy to help craft the what we will vote on. I remain very um, dubious of, you know, of, of supporting this, that, um, that I, I, I think part of what has us so fraught right now is that the nature of the tool that we're trying to work with here, and it's called the cap, and, and, and with it comes all of these these feelings and, 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 and aspirations and, and, and that it's a really imperfect tool for us to be able to address the concerns that folks are talking about. 
-hmm. and that um, and that um, I, you know, I, I believe that everybody who's participated in these meetings is super concerned about kids, you know, and, and youth. I have no doubt about that. I also know that everybody's concerned about our business community and whether or not, um, you know, how's it going? There are some empty shops and um, and having people to fill those shops is good. Um, I think that um, there is, you know, there rightfully should be some concerns about, you know, what adults are doing in our community and what they legally can do and and how um, how their behavior um, affects kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I, but I, you know, I will say this, I, 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 I shared information, you know, I shared a chart with folks um, the, the other day, um, uh, outlining data that, um, that reflects, you know, the, the data that is um, at what has been collected for um, NHS. And that um that I um uh, I I am glad that we have that. I've I've felt that um um that we've been talking about uh data of what's going on in the hill towns or other communities and the fact of the matter is we have data right here. We are part of the experiment that's going on. And when we, we embarked on this a few years ago, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of other stuff to look to. And that still remains true. And that, um, that I, I, I know we've seen a lot of, um, you know, especially in the, the last few days, you know, lots of uh, academic papers and research uh, that's been sent our way. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to read this too. And, and the fact of the matter is all of those things, California, wherever it is, it's not us. It's we, and, and the fact of the matter is that when, when I look at our data and I, and I agree with Carolyn's assessment that that 17% is on the low side and probably reflects the, um, uh, the fact that it's been harder to um, collect data. But I also think if even if you start to build in what is um, how to correct that, what I see is I see level numbers. and I, I, I we have twelve dispensaries, and those numbers maintain their level. The other thing is I I, I, I have a really difficult time with this, this notion that if kids know what their parents are doing, what their perception of cannabis is, that if they have some positive or, or they use or something like that, somehow that's a bad thing for the kids. And, and as a parent who's, who's gone through that process of raising teenagers, what part of what happens, what I saw, what you can see is the data. Eighth graders have, it's down here, like, Oh, they don't know a lot about their parents. You know, 10th graders, they know a little more. 12th graders, yeah, they know a lot more about their parents because that reflects the discussions that are going on at home. That people are actually, that the, that the discussions that we, that the Prevention Coalition is, is asking our kids to do and our families to do is happening. That, that youth, they they are not persuaded by by they need they really desire reality and truth and then you have their ear if you're if you're trying to say don't do it you know it's bad and i'm not saying anybody's saying that but what i'm saying that will turn a youth off but if you're able to engage on them you know but hey before you go out to the prom tonight i want to tell you you know I want you to be safe and I want you to have a good time. And I also want you to think about these things. Don't get in a car, you know, with somebody who's who's using. And the thing is, when your kids go out there, you know, it, the 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 leash gets longer and longer. It's that, you know, it for me, I remember it started happening around, you know, nine, 10, 11, 
till till there's those times where they're just like going out. You hope they're telling you the truth about what's happening. And um, and what keeps that connection going is is having honest discussions. I when I look at the data, I I see um, I see our parents, I see our community, I see our prevention specialists all doing their job. I, I, I'm really, I, I, I know there's lots of concerns about kids and addiction. And I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking that having a cap to solve it, I, I don't think it's gonna do it. And, um, but I'm on board with looking at other things. I'm on board with looking at signage. I'm, I'm on board with, you know, trying to advocate with the CCC about, you know, the way they present. Um, I think we're we're up against some big obstacles there. Their CCC is not really super open to uh, communicating with us. Um, but I I, I just want to say I that I think the in, the intentions here are are not to, you know. I I think we all like kids. We all care about our community. I just don't think this is the way to do it. Um, and um, I'll end there. Thank you. Councillor Perry. I have to apologize because my internet isn't working. So everyone else is frozen. I'm hoping I I'm not frozen. <laughs> um, first off, I, I just want to thank all the councillors. Um, for their deep discussions and thoughts on this, especially to the counselors who, who brought this forward. Um, I also wanna thank everyone in the public. You know, all of us counselors here have received a lot of correspondence over the last few months on this issue. Um, and I just wanna state first that I am not against the idea of a cap, but I am firmly against this cap as presented. Um, no disrespect to the sponsors, but this does not address any of the issues purported to necessitate introducing this ordinance. Um, but before I get into the reason why I think that, I, I do want to also touch on something that has disturbed me about this discussion, and it's been alluded to, but I feel like a lot of this has been framed with a subtle insinuation that if you aren't for this specific cap, then you're against the youth. Um, I think that's a little bit hurtful as a parent, a bit tone deaf and far from the truth. Um, you know, we, again, as, as Councillor Nash said, we're all concerned about our youth here and the community here. Um, moving back to why I think that this does not address any of the issues is one, if, if the idea is that youth consumption and density in our city is, is the issue, then this does not reduce the amount of dispensaries we have and, and I agree, 12 is a lot. If you talk to any dispensary owner, they also agree 12 is a lot. What this does, I believe, is set us up for possibly having 12 dispensaries in perpetuity or for a while. Um, I think it's likely to disrupt a market that is working itself out. I know that if I owned a dispensary and I found out that my failing business or my business is not doing well, suddenly, because of the introduction of a cap, my license became valuable, the first thing I would do is get on the phone with a multi-state operator. I would look for a, a big fish to come in and say something like, well, look at, look at this. I've got a turnkey operation in downtown Northampton. You know, social consumption might be down the road. This is a good opportunity. I would try and leverage my license for more money. Um, and so instead of closing, I think that we will find a bunch of dispensaries who hold on to it in the hopes that somebody will come in and save them. Um, you know, in, in, and also in terms of, uh, you know, people talked about the underground market and all that. I don't want to get into it too much, but the underground market is real. Um, you know, someone said earlier today that most people get weed from their friends, but where do their friends get it from? It's either someone uh, who, who received it or, or a dealer in essence, that person who was giving them is the underground market. Um, the second point is that this will also not help any social equity applicants. Um, 
you know, there's there's no assistance. There's nothing that really pushes that forward. I think it's a it's a great goal to wish because the war on drugs has destroyed inner cities and youth. I, I come from DC. I know very much what it's like to see how um, you know sentencing and, and drug crimes have, have ruined black and brown communities. Um, finally, I think that we we kind of have an, a mechanism. You know, we've talked about these HCAs. Um, we've just seen that ultimately the mayor has the final say so for any business. We did, you know, there's outcry for Florence. You know what happened is our mayor did not sign a post community agreement. Um, so I feel like there is some control. Um, you know, that for me, this feels like a message. It's a message to show that we do care about the youth, um, which is a great message to, to say. But I do not think writing this ordinance is the way. A resolution, sure. Um, but but it really, I, I can't see what this ordinance in its current form accomplishes. Um, with that being said, I also have to say that uh, some of this discussion here is a little disheartening. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about Northampton being a weed capital and all these things. Um, I, I see us kind of stepping into a mistake we made before with our liquor licenses. As someone who has spent most of my adult life in the entertainment and service industries, I, I've struggled against a system where one person in our community owns the majority of liquor licenses because they could afford it. It really boxed out um, other businesses. You know, we, I've watched over the years as slowly all of our independent venues have been squeezed out because in part, it's very difficult to get a liquor license. Um, you know, that I, I don't wanna see us repeat these mistakes. We are here talking about the youth in the future and a lot of the discussion doesn't seem very forward thinking. We are here discussing something that was brought up in the past. Um, you know, I, I agree, I think a cap would have been great in the past. I would very much rather us be thinking about what the future of this market is, whether it's social consumption, whether, it, whether it's the diversification of what marijuana dispensaries look like, but we're not doing that. We're not even thinking about what education and other things. And, and something that stood out to me today uh, was, I think his name was Henry. He's the only person who spoke who was under the age of 21. And he talked about a lot, a lot of the lack of trust in um, that the youth community has with, with um, you know, the, the prevention community. And I, I think that education, no nonsense education, I think is what he said, um, you know, access to addiction counseling, access to, to fentanyl strips, things like that, like looking to provide real harm reduction is where we should be going. And this does not do that. I, I would hope that that's what we're really thinking about if we're concerned about the youth. Um, you know, I, I think that Northampton is known as a progressive town. And I think that we have a chance to really be a, a beacon of hope, to be inspirational, to be forward thinking. And personally, none of this is very forward thinking. It feels like we got caught flat footed and we're just trying to um, you know, show that we do know that there's concerns, but it does not address those concerns. Thank you. Councillor Maori. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I found Henry very compelling as well. And I don't think Henry knew that we had the social equity part of our ordinance because he brought that up as well. I, you know, basically, I just want to say I don't think it's either or. I think, you know, we can't legislate education, but I'm sure all of these, you know, I'm very confident this council would support anything put in front of us, you know, that the mayor would bring to, to um, fund an educational initiative. So I, I really don't think it's either or. Uh, this is just one part of the puzzle. Uh, Councillor Elkins. Um, just, I, and I, I know folks are kind of crafting away at something we may come back to, um, but, and I'm not hiding the ball. I was, you know, clear about where I stood in legislative matters. Um, but I, I do want to go ahead and offer my my remarks, um, and I'll be candid. I'm hoping to persuade some of the the undecided uh, on the fence voters or votes. You know, I I 
there's uh that's what we do so i don't uh want to hide the ball on that on that i, I first of all i want to thank everyone i do I, I i do thank the sponsors um for uh bringing this forward i in fact i was the one who said like what are we talking about here let's have you know let's be talking about something specific and um and so i do uh i do appreciate that i also thank everyone who's reached out um i have found this discussion uh, both in committee meetings and in the meetings that, uh, and then it, uh, at least in the committee meetings, our council committee meetings, um, and and the emails and correspondence I've received to be thoughtful and civil, um, and and this is very important in good faith um, that everybody is starting from the assumption that we want what's best for our city and for our children, um, and. I, I do also want to say I, to everybody out there who has emailed me and sent me anything, I've read everything. I've read all the reports. Uh, I I know I know some people might be frustrated with me that I don't always get back to people. Um, I want you to know I do read everything and I uh, do take everything into consideration. And my mother also would like me to call her more uh, is, is what I would say to that. Um, but pl please do know, I do appreciate all of that and do take it into consideration. So um, I appreciate everybody's worked on this issue and brought information to our attention. And one thing is very, very, true is that I, you know, I have been, you know, being before this was raised and, and certainly since um, the euphorium and then now this legislation, you know, consistently hearing concern about the number of dispensaries in Northampton and the concerns are voiced in a number of ways. They are, it's a wide range of concerns. Um, you know, some people are, I would say everybody, everybody's concerned about the public health aspect and, and the effect on the kids. Uh, especially kids. Um, some folks are concerned about the town, the culture, the image, um, what it says about how we look like. Some people are concerned about the business aspect, about the uh, the you know vacant storefronts. All of these things are valid. I will say some I share. I think the most obvious ones. I obviously share the concerns about uh, about children. Um, and you know I'll you know some I find less persuasive. I, I find some things uh, uh, less uh, that I just disagree, I disagree about what that, uh, you know, tone and culture and the idea that we are developing a, an industry here that that uh, is uh, new and, uh, you know, different and some people might find acceptable. I, honestly, I, I've never set foot in a dispensary. I, just not my thing, but I am, uh, but you know that, but that I, I I'll be candid with you. I don't I don't find that particularly persuasive. But I am concerned, obviously, about the public health aspect, and about the overall um, business economic effect on our city. I want to start out by saying I'm very much in favor of regulation of the mayor of the cannabis industry. I most especially um, many of these things have been said at the state level, but most especially product testing, um, uh, purity, dosage, all those things. Um, I'm also very in favor of regulation at the retail level to make sure that sites are safe and that underage folks um, don't have access. Um, I also, to the extent it's been delicate, it's been um, uh, afforded to the powers of the municipality, I'm very much uh, would support. And frankly, I hope, because one thing I have heard that I'm, I do see some um, connection and causation with um, is the, uh, I would hope to work with my colleagues uh, in the future about uh, advertising and marketing. Um, I'll say when we all, everybody in the city got mailers from the East Hampton establishment, fire ants, uh, I think with coupons, I was appalled. Like that shouldn't happen. I'm not entirely sure that that was legal in the first place when they did that. But you know, there's stuff to work on. And 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 uh, and and when we talk about sending a message to young people, like advertising and marketing is literally a message. Um, and and that is something that seems sort of concrete and that I want to uh, uh, work on. But I would ask, I I also want to uh, comment on C Councillor Foster's comments about about um, the data and the way some of it's been received by 
Um, uh, uh, not anybody here that I've seen tonight, but I've, we've been in other contexts where the way that it's been questioned and uh, so forth, I've had, I've taken, you know, taken some issue with, um, but the, uh, I guess I would ask, because what I keep hearing over and over again is density is correlating to higher use. And so is the goal to either keep, is our goal to have, so if, if so many people are saying that what we have is is uh, too much, um, is our goal to um, reduce, is our goal to um, keep it the status quo? And the reason, I just want to kind of put a pin in that question of like, what is our goal here? What are we trying to accomplish here? And if the goal is fewer, um, you know, I would suggest the case has not been made that this legislation is going to achieve that. In more likelihood, I, I'm really concerned that what we're going to do is freeze the market as it is. I want to address one thing, which is something that's come up a, a few times, which is the question of the secondary market, market for license. Uh, in the cases of liquor, liquor licenses, you know, we have a situation where I think we would have more establishments serving liquor uh, and alcohol, and it's suppressed the number of, of restaurants um, that might have opened up otherwise. I'm really afraid, and as somebody else has pointed, as I think one of our commenters pointed out, you know, a lot of this is speculation. I'm not an economist, but I'm really concerned that a cap at this point is going to freeze the market and actually have the effect of keeping us that we'll have 12 and we'll always have 12. Um, and and that's and that's what we're and that's what we're going to have. Um, and we're also definitely, definitely, when we put a cap on, going to have a secondary market. Now I know, and um, I know uh, uh, it has been expressed that a, 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 at least one counselor has expressed that a, any, that he doesn't anticipate that there's not an anticipation the secondary market would be big. It's not a matter of if the secondary market is big or literal or one or two. It is the fact that a secondary market is negative if it exists. It perverts the market in ways that we don't know. Um, I would I think I think there's a real likelihood that that it's going to pervert the market in the sense that we're going to have 12 and we're going to continue to have 12 um and that it's going to naturally it's going to inhibit the the natural contraction that we already see happening um I uh you know I this seems to I, I see it happening we already see it and so I but meanwhile if we have licenses people are going to buy them People are going to stake it. Um, and with this legislation, I understand the, the 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 intent behind the social equity issue, but it means it is definitely written into the law that there is a mechanism for more shops to open. It's definitely there. Um, there is definitely a mechanism for more shops to open. And we don't have any control over whether or not big cannabis from outside the state you know, controls that, incentivizes that to somebody who qualifies to apply for that license under the social equity licenses. We don't have any control over that. Um, and it definitely creates incentives, as Councillor Garrick said, as Councillor Perry said, um, for existing proprietors to sell to big cannabis rather than to um, letting the market do what it's already doing. Um, and um, and yet it's unclear, assuming that correlation equals causation, what number, whether it's 12, whether it's eight, whether it's five, what number is going to diminish this uh, this correlation, which I don't doubt the data, but the the the, the numbers that we've seen, I, I just I what I can't connect is is what the number is that will reverse these things. Um, now, I also want to say that. I'm so, so I'm at large. I'm trying to think holistically. I am I am concerned that this legislation is sponsored by counselors representing wards who have no dispensaries. Um, it is it is significant to me that um, that, uh, that 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 is the case. Um, I want to point out that 
so I, I will say I'm an economist. We've heard some things. We've heard some economists. We've heard some from some things. It makes sense to me that the market's going to freeze. One thing that seems really clear to me, though, is that the locations will freeze um, because there's investment in those buildings. There's very strict um, regulations and criteria for what they have to do in terms of security and to and to build up those things to so qualify for the licenses and things like that. So, so in terms of what is in Florence or not in Florence and what is in um, in ward you know wards essentially ones three and four, that's exactly where it's going to stay. Um, and uh, so it means that if it does free the, freeze the market and the locations are going to stay the same, so the licenses for the existing market, for the existing locations are going to become much more valuable. And meanwhile, anybody scouting a new location, even if they're a social equity candidate, even if they would otherwise qualify, uh, they would, um, they're essentially going to be priced out. It'd be astronomical. They cannot possibly enter the market in a, a new location. Um, so whether or not you're in favor, you know, whether or not you're somebody in Florence or Leeds and wants access or whether or not you live in one, three or four, and you wish there were fewer in your neighborhood, this legislation is going to make it mean that it's going to say exactly the same. I, I really do predict that. Um, I was questioning, uh, I was thinking to myself, what are the ethics of putting a bet down on this? And I don't mean to make light of it, but I, um, I, I just don't see why anybody would put the money in to scout out a location in Florence or Leeds, especially, and, and I understand the, com the community process has worked, but when they could uh, go and, and, and put the money down to buy what may have otherwise been a failing dispensary that would have been turned to another use um, down the road. Um, I... I want to just I want to follow up just to say I don't question or deny and this is very important because we've had some people we had a lot of people comment on the public health issues and we've had a, a, a couple of notable speakers who have uh, suggested uh, uh, who have suggested contrary thinking I do not uh, deny or question the negative health effects of cannabis use for kids period I do not it's bad for them it leads to all kinds of negative results. We don't question that. The question becomes harm reduction. Um, it's always going to be illegal for minors to possess or consume cannabis, regardless of the source. The legalization of cannabis does mean that the product in the market, legal or illegal, could be all or almost all a tested regulated product. It's been suggested that we might never achieve that, but we have achieved it with alcohol. We have achieved it with, uh, with cigarettes. We have achieved it with other vices, other things that are bad for public health. I don't understand why it couldn't be achieved with cannabis. And no one likes to imagine their kids drinking underage alcohol. Um, but we can all agree <laughs> that the penalty for our kids drinking alcohol underage, uh, you know, isn't that they get bathtub gin and go blind. It really does matter that the product in the market be regulated and tested and not be more dangerous than it otherwise has to be. I also want to say it's disappointing to hear concerns that I raised um, about the crime associated with the sites of illegal drug distribution dismissed. It is true, though much less, and I really do emphasize this, much less than many Northampton residents might assume that that doesn't happen, that it's not the most likely sources of, of, of much illegal um, sales, particularly at the organizational point happens here, but it is a reality for our neighboring communities. And we only disregard that from a position of privilege. We only disregard that the illegal market and at, especially at its sources, at the organizational sources happens um, if we do it from a position of it doesn't happen on our street. And A, yeah, I frequently incorrect assumption about Northampton and B, it's not true for our neighbors. And I, I would suggest that that should matter. We're addressing some of the issues with the bill as written, and I appreciate that. I still question that the social equity provision seems uh, ineffectual at best and could result in the opposite effect of adding more shops, um, very likely funded by national uh, big cannabis. Um, 
And so, and I appreciate, first of all, your patience. I know I don't always talk so much, but when I do, at least I, you know, I have notes, (laughs) Um, but I do want to, I do want to close by saying in the end, I appreciate the intent behind this. I appreciate the concern that's raised. I also appreciate the good faith that um, comes with everybody sort of agreeing that we're starting at the baseline of being concerned for our kids and public health. I'm not questioning that data. I'm not questioning any of that. I, my, my issue here is that this is economic legislation that is aimed at a public health issue. And that it's going to have unintended consequences that literally, it's not just like it's bad for the business. I really fear that it's going to go in the opposite direction and inhibit a contraction that otherwise might be happening. Um, so I, I really do. I urge my colleagues, even if we even if we tweak some of this, these concerns that I've raised, and with great respect for the sponsors who brought it forward um, and our shared concerns for our kids, I really uh, would urge my colleagues to, to vote no on this legislation. Um, you know what, I'm, I'm going to let Councillor Mayori go next, then Councillor Perry, because I think uh, Councillor Mayori will want to speak to something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'll keep it brief. I, I just, there was a lot said there. I just wanted to clarify my comments, which were actually more about um, Mr. Goldstein's uh, impl- impl- implying that if we keep opening retail, um, cannabis retail that we'll get rid of the unregulated market. That's all I was saying is that I don't feel um, I don't feel that that solution. Councillor Mayori, you're, you're, you're breaking up a little. So uh, in the past, I was really commenting on on crime or or, or how bad you know. That would, Council no. Mayor, you've turned your video okay. off. Okay, and, and that's all I want. That's fine. I'll, I'll just. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Well, yeah, huh. we actually lost what what you your last thirty seconds or so. Oh, I was just saying that. Yeah, my comments were 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 um, in response to Mr. Goldstein's um, um, assertion that we need more and more retail cannabis to. Uh, to get rid of the unregulated market. And I don't think that that, I don't think that retail cannabis retail because of the astronomical cost of entry at this point is, you know, there's only so low those prices can go. So I, it's not that I don't want cannabis to be regulated. I was just, uh, I was just stating that I don't think that cannabis retail is going to take care of that problem on its own. But I was not trying to minimize any kind of, um, you know, any any kind of experience around exposing children to crime or anything like that. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Mayori. And I hope your video comes back. We we miss seeing you. <laughs> um, so next up, it, let's go to Councillor Perry. And yes, I'll just keep this brief. Um, I just wanted to touch on something that Councillor Elkins brought up and it was in my notes. There's a lot of notes here. Um, And it really has to do with uh, balance and equity. We've been talking about that a lot. Um, As Councilor Elkin said, currently there are dispensaries in only three wards. Um, And I I think that this ordinance as it's presented will indeed lock these into, as we just heard from uh, Attorney Seawald, it will lock them into these positions. Um, And I think that is a disservice to some of our constituents. I was at a meeting in Florence and someone suggested, oh, there's enough. You could just take, you know, you could just go to downtown Northampton. Um, but that really shows a lack of, of knowledge and information about what these dispensaries are doing. Um, I have been in, in many of these dispensaries. I've talked to the owners. Um, and, and one of the things that I've marveled at is the level of interaction, the education, the advice, uh, the customer service. Um, you know, someone said in a meeting in Florence that, oh, well, there's, there's delivery options. Again, that takes away the fact that in these dispensaries, there are people who will walk you through. You know, there are people who might need access to these medicines who don't know. You, you can go on a website and you can see. Um, but 
But to deny them access to these resources kind of flies in the face of equity and imbalance. Um, you know, they're, it, it really, it's very NIMBY. Um, you know, it's, I take it as, as one of the counselors whose ward is half of downtown, you know, we operate on a different thing. That's where our bars are. That's where our nightlife is. Um, I remember at one of the, the meetings, someone talked about how when they need to get their medicine, you know, they're sober from alcohol, but they do use uh, marijuana. Uh, and when they go to downtown, then they frequent the establishments, they go to the restaurants, they do the things, and they really wish they had that in their area in Florence. And um, I, I just wanted to, to piggyback on that, that I, I really believe that what, what this ordinance states will lock us into these dispensaries in these places. And if you want your weed, you, you have to leave your ward and go get your medicine. And, and something about that just doesn't feel right for me. Thank you, Counselor. Counselor Gore. Um, I've been going back and forth on this and I think that it is true that it, there is a, a saturation of the market in downtown. Um, and it, it's not, it's not all over the city and that could be an, an equity thing, um, which I didn't think about before, honestly. Um, but I also think that, I mean, I, I personally feel that 12 shops or how many shops we have is quite a bit for our downtown. And I think of it more, uh, from an economic point of view, like how do we know where the, we don't know where the market is gonna go with a cap or without a cap. But I feel like if we put on a cap, that we could at least kind of have some kind of measure of the market. And I feel like, you know, um, I agree with Councilor Mayori that um, more, more retail shops won't necessarily uh, get rid of the, the black market. Um, but I, I also agree that, you know, uh, the secondary market, we don't want either, um, but there's ways to regulate that as well. Um, so I'm, I'm still grappling with it. I, I, I'm leaning to, I, I, I think that having a cap is doing something proactive but not having a cap and not doing anything at all, especially about the social equity piece, is just not addressing what we need to address. And I also feel for members of the sober community who have spoken out at meetings about how the saturation of dispensaries has affected them. And I, I believe personally that, you know, harm reduction and education is very important for the sober community and the youth. And I think that's the way to address it. I don't think a cap is necessarily gonna address that. Um, I don't know, I have a, I have a like a, maybe we could try it kind of idea. Maybe we could see, come back, give it a review in two years after, you know, um, because we've tried, you know, four or five years with the dispensaries going at the rate they're going. And um, I don't, I don't really want to, I don't really know how that's going to play out. And I, I don't think any of us really can predict the future on that. So um, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Thank you, Counselor. Um, Counselor Mayori, then Counselor Jarrett. Yeah, I hear those concerns. Um, I, you know, I mean, of course, we just had a business go go out of business. So there's that license. I, I, I kind of think how many, you know, if we want to, if we're so excited about the free market, there's a reason that Florence and Leeds haven't been chosen at the same rate. And, um, but we have the, but they still have the opportunity. There's a license that, you know, there's the one that just went out of business. And then there's the social equity piece, of course. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, so I think, it's happening again, Rachel. 
Right. I think what's happening is she's moving. looking at it. That's a concern about being locked in is our zoning, uh, which, you know, really is at play with. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Not, so, yes. yeah, I don't know what unstable it says. Internet connection unstable. So, yeah. Oh, great. So I was just saying that, you know, I mean, in terms of the free market, we've, we've had speed. that said, um, you know, of course, we're leaving that open. We have uh, the social equity um, business owners, and we've also just had the business go out of business. So we down to 11. So there's certainly the possibility. I don't think even with, with no cap that there were going to be a, a lot of stores in Florence and Leeds anyway. Uh, so I think that there's a reasonable amount of, of leverage there for for a store to be in Florence and Leeds. We have that one HCA now available. We have um, social equity candidates, and uh, we also haven't really addressed what's going to be happening with social, you know, consumption cafes. There's delivery services. There, there's going to be more marijuana besides retail. This is just one little part of it, and so that, I think we need to think about that. And if we're concerned about being locked in, we can certainly look at zoning, which of course favors stores downtown um, more than other places. I mean, Leeds doesn't have, Leeds has like, you know, just a couple businesses anyway, of any kind. So we're, you know, I think that's part of it, leave it at that. <laughs> so Councillor Jarrett, and then I see Councillor Elkins, and then Councillor Labarge, I got to write this down. <laughs> Give me a cue. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, a lot of really compelling and interesting comments so far. Um, I've really been trying to hold the space open and not be predisposed and avoid um, confirmation bias of just just looking at say the data or the evidence that that supports what I where I'm already leaning. Um, <clears throat> so going into that with that spirit. Um, I think the, you know, as I said in legislative matters, it's the most compelling case is that public health officials and professionals um, are really cautioning us and asking for a pause to be put on the numbers here. Now, maybe we already are at a pause, that is true. Um, and you know, is, is the market contracting, um, then this, this may not have much effect. Uh, <clears throat> although the, but to respect their, their data, their, um, what they have seen in terms of other, of tobacco and alcohol and retail density, and to look at it from the perspective of the precautionary principle. I also talked about this a little bit in legislative matters. You know, it's an approach for addressing unknown harms. And because cannabis legalization is relatively new um, and there aren't enough studies to draw firm conclusions, uh, but putting a pause on that number of outlets, we can take the time to gather more data and decide how to proceed. And in a couple of years, uh, that may be deciding that we want, we actually are okay with more. Um, so I guess the la other thing I wanted to say, uh, just to be clear that, that, you know, that I'm not taking, this, this ordinance doesn't take a prohibition stance. It's the regulation of the legal market and that we shouldn't be, no one should be punished or stigmatized. Um, for using can cannabis. And, um, but it doesn't mean that it's without harm and that the normalization of it has impacts. I think the cannabis industry's profit motives are in conflict with public health. Um, mm -hmm. And how we approach, how we move forward, what we, if we decide to pause or not, that will. <clears throat> That, that will, you know, that, that a pause will give us more time to see what happens. Um, and th it's interesting, you know, I was also grappling with the issue that this is, this is, this is a soft cap um, <laughs> because of the social e equity exception. Yeah. I'm certainly in favor of giving additional options to social equity applicants um, <clears throat> and it just it, it, that's, it seems like a, that there is a significant barrier. So 
it is essentially a slowing rather than a, than a hard stop at 12. Um, <clears throat> and we don't really know how, what will happen there. There, I do have concerns about the, um, the, you know, someone kind of propping up a social equity applicant just so they can get that license. That is a concern. Um, but a, a sort of a worst case is we get more, we got, there are more shops, uh, the social equity applicants benefit, and then we re review again and see where we're at. Um, so that's, you know, it's, this is really not an easy decision. Um, and where it's, it is about balance and where that comes down. And I hear the, the equity concerns about the locations, the, um, and that I, I but I feel I, I am coming down in support. Um, I think that this is actually a pretty moderate approach. It, it leaves us at the very top of municipalities in terms of retail cannabis. Um, it balances public health and, and social equity and economics. Uh, and so I'm uh, planning to support it. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, back to Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett. Now to Councillor Elkins and then Councillor Labarge. I, 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 oh. <laughs> I think he's going backwards to the previous so. order of, yeah. Uh, the order? No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. But if, if Council LaBarge wants to speak, I'll. No. I'll I, okay, I will. Okay. Okay, go. Thank you. And this is in regards to Councilor Elkins. You had stated something about like the outer wards, Ward 6, Ward 7. We do have an area in Ward 6. We have the Willard's gravel pit that was bought by a group to go ahead and open up a marijuana factory in there. They bought it, they own it, but it's been sitting there, sitting there. Attorney Elkins, sitting there. I have gone to Wayne, nobody has heard anything yet. We don't know if there's a financial problem going on. It's been sitting there for two and a half, three years, but that's what it was bought for. And also Jim's Variety Store in Ward 6, that's a possibility something could happen there. If you talked about Ward 7, there's a possibility of areas out there so no matter what, I think every ward possibly could be affected. I just wanted to let you know that because I didn't know if you knew that that was bought and that there is a manufacturing pot farm or factory that's going to possibly go in there at some point. Don't know yet. And we're hoping maybe not. Maybe they'll decide to sell it. And we can have affordable housing in there. Right. Well, and, and I appreciate that, Council of Arge. I, I, I guess my A, this is about uh, retail cannabis. Um, so I, it, I don't understand the, the, the gravel uh, pit property to be a retail cannabis point. Right. Although I will say that that's part of the thing that I'm concerned about is the idea that there are other possible locations uh, throughout the city that are zoned um, for for cannabis that now will never have them. And I understand that some, I do understand that some people want that, um, but not everybody does. And, and I'm also concerned about wards, you know, one, three, and four, um, that to the extent that there are folks there who don't like the negative effects that they, uh, you know, that they are also stuck with their situation. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, and that I'm very concerned of. Uh, the point, um, Councillor uh, Nash, that I wanted to uh, respond to is that one of the things that I'm, I actually am really concerned forward looking um, about social use and, you know, social use sites and things like that is that, um, is that our existing locations, um, I, I, I can, I can only, it seems logical to me that existing dispensaries, retail dispensaries will be grandfathered in, in some regard. 
Um, so we are already, so we're also locking in future social use sites as well. Um, and, and we aren't even really anticipating that. I, and I just want to emphasize again, I, you know, I, um, uh, I have an 11 year old, my, uh, and, and she tells me she thinks there are too many, uh, pot shops. And it's, it's not that I disagree with her. I, I am really concerned that, that, that what, what this, that what this cap doesn't allow for is the contraction we are we are we are taking out the ability for the the market to correct itself and contract um by adding a secondary market um so i mean whether you agree whether you think whether you do think there should be lots more i think this leaves open the possibility that there could be more and i think it really reduces it makes it harder for this market to contract so to the extent i'm not disagreeing with public health um experts um, it, I, you know, I see the correlations they're talking to about, and I, I was troubled by the statistics that I, I saw as well, um, and see the anecdotal. I just, I, I think, I think the precautionary principle here would be to, especially since we've already lost one, is to step back and, and if it doesn't correct itself to our satisfaction, you know, then come back in two years and then legislate. I don't, I, I, when the market is doing the thing that public health experts are telling us is the right direction, what, what do we gain by doing something that might, you know, automatically create one open spot at a minimum and then the possibility for more? So that's all I'm saying. I, I, I am not rooting one way or the other. I'm, I'm not rooting for more cannabis shops. I don't have any interest in it. I don't have any. Uh, concern, and I and I certainly don't doubt the public health implications. I think that this is an economic policy um, that is going to, uh, frankly, have the reverse effect than what the public health experts are calling for. I respect the public health experts; they are not economic experts. Councillor Perry, and then I'm going to go. All right, I just have a quick question about the host community agreements. Uh, is it Attorney Seawald? Are you still here? Sorry to bother you if you're not. <laughs> Where is he? There he is. So, uh, Attorney C. Wall, sorry, I can't see everyone because my, my screen is uh, frozen again. Is it but my question is, the host community agreement, that is the step, as you said, early in the process. Um, you know, it, it's where you declare your intention to open up a marijuana establishment, correct? <laughs> Well, it's it may be the first um, introduction to the community. Yes, it, you okay. know, that, that often is, although it doesn't necessarily have to be. There could be contact with the mayor's office before requesting an HCA. And the mayor has the authority to reject uh, a host community agreement because of the impact on a community. There's a number of restrictions, correct? Mm -hmm. As long as there's a rational basis for doing so. Okay. So what it seems to me is that the host community agreement is already a stopgap. Um, am, am I correct in that assumption? It is a stopgap, but it's just, uh, obviously that, you know, at the mayoral level, yes. Okay. Uh, is there a way to get around that and open a shop or? Is it... No, you have to have an HCA and the city has to certify to the CCC that it has signed an HCA with this applicant in order for the application to be complete. Okay. So, for instance, if in, in our terms where the mayor has already turned down uh, HCA and has shown that she is willing to take into account community um, and, and the repercussions, uh, do you feel there needs to be something extra to, to check and balance that? Or uh, I'm not in the business of, of, you know, getting into what's a good idea or not a good idea. Right. Um, this is something that can be done by the city council. Um, and, you know, those are political questions you're asking me. And, I, and I've got one foot in each camp, Councillor. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for that. That's really, I just needed a little bit of explanation. Um, for me, it does seem like uh, just through our experience recently that there is a way to speak out and to deal with this. And again, I go back to the fact that I don't feel like uh, this ordinance as proposed 
addresses any of the issues. It does not increase uh, de decrease the density. You know, if, if we're really looking towards the fact that 12 is a lot, I think we all agree with that. I think we all have stated that we don't want more. I believe that the mayor has stated that. Um, this ordinance does not address that. It, it doesn't, for me, really address the social equity. So um, yeah, I, I really feel like the HCA is, is strong and um, thank you. Um, Officer Moulton, I'm gonna let you go because you haven't spoken yet. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Nash. I appreciate that. Um, I too uh, appreciate uh, the, uh, the careful discussion that we've had over the past six months. Uh, we've had hours of, of testimony uh, at all four uh, committees of the council. And uh, I, I, I really uh, thank all my colleagues for their thoughtful uh, comments. Uh, both uh, earlier and and tonight, this this is this has been an, an instructive and I think very important community conversation. Uh, in in reflecting on on this ordinance, uh, it, for me it is as others have said it's a it's a balancing act, and uh, I think uh, when we look back at the effort uh, four years ago to to, to uh, uh, place a cap uh, before the uh, the legal uh, 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 dispensaries opened. Uh, that was a cap proposed at 10. It's described by the sponsors back then as a circuit breaker. And I, and of course it, it was defeated, but I don't, I don't recall during that time, anyone predicting that uh, over the course of the first four years of, of legalized uh, uh, cannabis uh, uh, dispensaries that there would be as many as as twelve opening in in Northampton. I think ten was was felt to be perhaps the ceiling. I I think it's very difficult to predict where the market is going to go at this point. Um, uh, the uh, the price the wholesale supply the, uh, has has increased the price of, of of legal retail cannabis has has come down substantially uh, so I'm not uh, I'm not satisfied uh, to to let the market sort of play out and I think it would not be in the community's best interest for us to, take another two years of seeing where the market goes. Uh, I am uh, I am very, uh, I'm feeling uh, like this is a, a moderate approach as, uh, as one of my colleagues said, uh, this is not radical. Uh, we, we would join some 60 other municipalities in the state that have placed a cap on dispensaries, including our most immediate neighbors, Amherst, East Hampton, Hadley, mm -hmm. Southampton, and Williamsburg. Um, to me, it is a question of, of considering the public health concerns. Oh, yes. And when I look at the data, uh, I look at not just the Northampton data, but I like to look at the local data as it compares to, to other studies that have been done nationally. And when uh, Commissioner uh, Meredith O'Leary uh, called for a pause on the number of dispensaries in Northampton, she cited uh, the Rand Corporation study that was published two years ago in the American Journal on Addictions. And that was a study that was done in Los Angeles County. And it did find that the density of licensed marijuana outlets was associated with young adults, marijuana use, heavy use, and intention to use. And that backs up uh, what I have found very credible uh, in the, the correlations that have been associated with the data that's been produced by, by Spiffy. Uh, and, and we've looked at uh, most recently, we've looked at Northampton specific data. We've separated out Northampton from that category of communities that have five or more uh, dispensaries. So we know that based on the uh, surveys that Spiffy has done, 
that Northampton teens report that they're more likely both to smoke uh, weed and to, and to uh, consume edibles because they've been legalized than the percentage of, of, uh, of teens reporting countywide. Uh, and and uh, 12th graders in Northampton would surveyed last year uh, uh, report heavier uh, uh, marijuana consumption compared to uh, those uh, uh, countywide. So we have local data that to me uh, indicates that a that what we're doing here is we're not we're not we're not this is not a draconian proposal. We are essentially establishing the status quo for a period of time and we're going to allow further further data to be gathered. And that to me is the is the safest, uh, approach for the entire community, because I don't think that the free the free market, when when uh, businesses are looking at uh, coming in, either coming into Northampton or uh, 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 you know selling a license, uh, they're looking at the uh, the likelihood of business success, which is an economic calculation. And I'm 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 afraid I don't I don't think that. Uh, the impact on public health is really part of that equation. So that's why uh, I'm supporting this ordinance. Thank you, Council. Okay, I I'm gonna recognize myself here and that, um, so uh, I, 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 again, the, the, the data that's been shared, there's been, um, I, I, I am not seeing that same conclusion around how Northampton is standing out from uh, other cities and towns countywide. I think it's an unfair um, uh, comparison. I, I'm standing up for our community here in terms of the work we're done, we've done and, and, and the decisions that the data shows for Northampton. I see a drop in the reporting from the um, the other per prevention communities who are don't have dispensaries that if you look at I, I've looked at the data you know the, the 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 populations for these surveys have dropped um, the, the the surveys back in uh, 2015 2017 were nearly double the ones that were getting this information from them um, and so. I, 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 you know, I, what I suspect is going on is, you know, with, with those neighboring towns is there's underreporting going on and that we're unfairly judging, you know, what our youth, the actual, the actual decision-making that our youth are doing right now. Um, and um, so I, but I, but I, I understand the concern. Um, the other thing is, I what's left out of this whole discussion is the impact of this discussion. <laughs> that in terms of, let's say I want to open up a shop here in in Northampton, and I got to go through a public meeting to open up a cannabis dealer. That's right. And that while we are talking about a pro prohibition that has these invitations to grow and, um, and that uh, the reality is that if I'm gonna drop a lot of money, why would I subject myself to a public conversation that's gonna, that, you know, that may result in me not getting, being able to actually open the place. And, and I think that would apply to social equity candidates as well. That you know, if if you're pulling your money together and you're looking for a spot to, you know, to to open such a business, the idea of that I I, I got to go through a public meeting to get there, and and that um, and I, I I I my sense is that there should some you know some place one open uh, in in certain parts of the city that. There, there's going to be a big turnout, and um, uh, I'm, I'm not hopeful that 
that would move forward. I think this conversation has an impact. And so, um, so I, I just want to say that. Um, I think I'm done. Councillor Foster. Thanks, Councillor Nash. Um, your, I, I, your point is well taken about the impact of the of the conversation, you know, sort of um, larger. I just wanted to, I, I think now respond to that as well as um, the, you know, questioning about don't we already have a mechanism um, for pausing the market, which is through the host community agreements. And um, that, or, or, you know, that there could be now kind of a big public turnout at, um, you know, a, a public meeting um, for, an, you know, as one of the steps in the process of a proposed um, retailer coming in. And my worry about not being concrete mm -hmm. is that we're actually opening up potential for more nimbyism and I and you know the point is is taken I you know I represent a ward that that does not have a dispensary I, I I hear that um but at the same time if we're leaving it to like is there so much public pressure that a host community agreement isn't signed or you know is there fear about trying to hold a community meeting in this area because so many people will turn out, um, that has repercussions as well. And, um, you know, as far as, as leaving the authority to the judgment of the mayor with a host community agreement, um, I respect our mayor. I, I um, you know, we, we are fortunate at the moment, um, I believe to have a mayor who's, who's working really hard to balance a whole lot of competing interests in this city, um, and it's it's a lot. There's probably thirty thousand different viewpoints on on each issue that's being balanced. Um, but as a council, this is actually an authority that we have as a nine member body um, representing each of the wards as well as the at, at large. Um, so this is an authority that we have, and um, you know it's 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 a challenge because our charter does have a strong mayor form of government. Our mayor, no matter who is. Um, in that position has a lot of authority and and there's some very good reasons for that but at the same time I am cautious about handing over responsibilities um, and um, authority of the legislative branch to the executive um, kind of no matter who's there whether I trust that person's judgment or you know or, or perhaps down the road you know a mayor whose judgment we don't trust. Like I, we while we have that authority as a, as a nine member body, um, that is authority that we can use right now. I guess rather than than handing this over to the executive branch. Exactly. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Well, um, Councillor Foster's got her hand up. Yeah, Councillor Foster, I was going to ask you about your amendment. That is why my hand is back up. I just, um, I, I, I didn't want to just switch gears without a pause. Um, so I'll, I'll share. Um, tell me, I've got the right thing here. Okay. Um, so this, this would be the proposed amendment that takes those suggestions into account. Um, the following ordinance, the following shall be exempt from the limitations set forth in this ordinance. The one that we've already discussed, the social equity candidates, and then two would be simplified to read, this ordinance shall not apply to a retail establishment or a proposed retail establishment for which a host community agreement has been signed by the mayor as of the effective date of this ordinance. So that removes the, the um, question about leasing and property owners and, and that sort of thing that, that was um, raising concern. Uh, maybe people can't see, but I'm raising my hand. There you were. I was, I was staring away. I'm like, where are the hands? I see his hand. <laughs> right. Hello, uh, Councillor Jarrett. 
Yeah, um, thanks, Councillor Foster. Um, but wasn't there another section about exempting delivery? And was that an important change? Or making it was it was something to confirm that the delivery was not included in this. So I think that's not on the ordinance. Um, that's I with well, two things. One is um, just a, a pause. Councillor Elkins needed to leave and come back to the meeting. Can we make her a co-host so that she can unmute? Um, and then there there was that exemption. Um, Solicitor Seawald, do you mind popping back on? I, I saw your camera on a minute ago. Um, because we could we could include that piece. I, um, I, I only popped on because I had the same observation oh, okay. that uh, Council Jarrett had. All right. I see out there, Councillor Maori. I'm wondering if this kind of, uh, uh, Councillor Foster, did you, and Councillor Jarrett, did you get your answer there? Or are you? <laughs> um, well, if, if if that was an important clause that, that, yeah, would, so that we don't want to accidentally exclude. I, I know okay, so. And it seems like we should include that. We don't want to exclude those yeah, businesses. Uh, may I suggest a two minute break while that edit is made? Sure, go ahead. Sure. I mean, and, and I'm, I'm gonna leave because I need to for two minutes anyway, but. If anybody else does. Let's make it for five minutes and then um, Karen can also have a break too after Thank she. you. <laughs> and if anybody's going outside, I'll tell you right now, we got freezing rain out here.
Is it five minutes yet? Yeah. 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 Is it is it freezing rain out there where you are? I didn't look. It, it's, it is. Our deck I, is loaded. I hope it is. I have a beer sitting out on the porch getting cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, this is turning into a jam session. And you have your guitar out? I'm, I wish I could teleport over there. Uh, two guitars? Oh! <laughs> I know. <laughs> Why are you put them away? I'm disappointed. Come on, Jim. Some people go outside and look at the freezing rain. I play guitar. Okay. <laughs> so I don't think the bears will come out when it's like this. No, probably not. My toilet was clogged up, so I had that. That's what I did. In addition to the things that led me to discover that it was clogged up. <laughs> Okay. It's now it's good. We may resume. <laughs> Councilor Foster, should we keep chatting, or do you have something to share with council? Uh, that that was a great discussion. Um, yeah, yeah. Let, let me bring that that up. Um, my my apologies. That was inadvertent. That um, a lot of different pieces of information here. So let me share my. I screen. also want to recognize that Councilor Maori had her hand raised, but. I mean, she's not here to speak. So let's go. Let's go with this, and she'll have uh, first up after you're finished presenting. Okay. Is that showing? I I left red to show the changes. Um, so this would be section B. Um, the ordinance shall be exempt from the limitations set forth in this ordinance. One we've gone over. Um, two a retail establishment or a proposed retail establishment for which a host community agreement has been signed by the mayor as of the effective date of this ordinance. And three, a host community agreement executed after the effective date of this ordinance solely for delivery or courier of cannabis products other than delivery to the consumer over the counter at a retail cannabis establishment. Other than to All right. Um, let's see. Anybody raising their hands here? I'll stop. See oh, if you can go. go back. Um, counselors. Um, so, uh, do are people good with what you've seen right there on the screen? Do we need to bring it back up or? No. I'm fine right. with it because I know we did talk about delivery and stuff like that before, because there's a whole article about that and about the difference between delivery and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we, this isn't officially on the floor yet. And I, Councillor May, <laughs> you had your hand up a little earlier. Oh, I was just going to clarify that that language about, you know, about deliveries. The, um, was added when we um, when we when we changed language to the lease. So I went, was looking to solicitor oh, yeah. to see if we needed the language when we went back to the HCA, uh, because yeah. So that's what I was putting out there. Is that um, I'm not sure if it, that was general language he thought should be added no matter what, or if it was con some somehow contingent on the on the lease part because it was added at that point. That's all I was going to say. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, city solicitor. I think it should be added in any case. Thank you. Uh, I move the amendment as was shown on Councillor Foster's screen. Second. Or do we have to put the whole thing on the floor first? Right? It's not even on the floor at all. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's put okay. it. On withdraw, the floor. I'll withdraw that. Yeah. Thank but, you. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this conversational no motion style that we do, old school, we would have, we wouldn't even be talking without a motion. So um, I'll entertain a motion. 
Uh, I move for approval of the proposed ordinance as amended by uh, Councillor Foster. Second. Okay. Um, motion made by Councillor Moulton and uh, seconded by Councillor Mayori. Um, okay, so we're now, so just to be clear, the, the, the amendment as uh, put forth by Councillor Foster is now officially for, folded in, and that's what's on the table. Okay. All right. Um, any discussion around? All right. So it's already folded in. We have a motion on the floor. Any discussion about this ordinance? <laughs> Before any further discussion. Okay, uh, hearing none, Laura, roll call. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Moulton. Yes. Councilor Nash. No. Councilor Perry. No. Councilor Elkins. No. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Gore. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. Um, the item 22.201, an ordinance limiting the number of retail cannabis establishments in the city of Northampton has passed on second reading. Okay. Uh, Councillor Jarrett. Just have a process question. Uh, you know, we know the mayor is opposed to this. And if she chooses to veto it, it will come back at our next meeting and then we have to vote again and, oh, with six true. votes. Is that the- It's in the charter. Yeah, I think so, that's- So to uh, override a veto, it is six votes. Okay. Right. And um, mm -hmm. that I'm not sure the timing if it is the next meeting. I am, I, my, it's my expectation, my understanding the mayor needs to create a report explaining her veto. I don't know the timeline on that. Maybe Laura knows that. Laura, yeah, you have. I want to say it's ten days after that that the council has to reconsider. Um, I have to check the charter though. Okay. I um, hey, maybe Attorney Seawalt could do that while he's hanging out. <laughs> um. All right, oh, and um, yeah. and so he'll uh, so Councillor Jarrett, uh, uh, Attorney Seawald will update us on um, what the timeline is on the mayor's response in a few minutes. Great, thank you. Okay, um, are people okay with me moving on to the next thing? And um, Attorney Seawald will pop in with that information when it's ready. Um, Item next up is item 22.2202, an ordinance relative to parking on Holly Street. Um, let's see, is there is there anybody here to speak to this? I think it's down to me and Alex again to speak to these things. <laughs> um, let's see, I'm pulling it up, it's coming up. Okay, uh, so. This uh, has uh, been uh, introduced, actually this came out of the TPC. This came out of a recommendation that I worked on with a constituent. It has to do with increasing the no parking zone at the corner of Butler and Holly Street. Um, it, Laura, can you pull up the, there's actually a really helpful um, pictures of the parking zone here. Uh, one second. Sorry, I was glancing at the charter myself. <laughs> <laughs> See, Lori, you're so good you can't help yourself. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so you can see how in the previous, the, the top picture, you can see that the um, 
the no parking zone in, extends uh, or the the place where parking is allowed extends right up to the corner and then on the bottom if you could bring it down a little more laura sure there we go it so that creates a, a 50 foot uh, uh buffer uh the the sidewalk there is actually raised higher than the uh, probably about three to four feet higher than the uh, roadway and so that plus having a car parked there on the corner makes it really difficult to see and um so this recommendation was made by dp dpw it's come through the tpc it's been the legislative matters it's here tonight and there's going to be one happy person on butler place who made this request uh, several years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that is the, the story on that. Any other questions? Okay, um, hearing, uh, I guess we need a motion to approve this. Move approval. Second. I get the second. So Councillor Jarrett, and then I'm gonna guess Councillor Perry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, okay, any discussion on this? Okay, hearing none. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Moulton? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Perry? Yes. Councillor Elkins? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Gore? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Mayori. Yes. Okay. Uh, item 22.220, <laughs> an ordinance relative to parking on Holly Street has been approved. Next up, item 22.220. Councillor 20 Nash, um, Attorney Seawald has the answer. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, he needs to it's unmute. not that I don't I'm... want to sit through more parking oh, legislation, yes, <laughs> but... <laughs> I can tell you that the council has three business days to submit this to the mayor. The mayor, uh, if if the mayor disapproves, must uh, provide specific reason for the disapproval. Not less than 10 and not more than 30 days thereafter, the council must reconsider it. Okay. Obviously, if the mayor doesn't do anything with it for 10 days, it's deemed approved. Okay. Thank Any you. Any questions? No. Nope. With that, I, I if if uh, I'm not needed any longer, I will say good night. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Attorney Seawall. <laughs> okay. Take solidarity, but we'll let you go. I know. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> All right. Um. Uh, next up, item twenty two point two two one, an ordinance relative to stop signs on Middle Street, High Street, and Clement Street. And I'm going to turn this one over to Councillor Jarrett to explain. Sure. Yes, that. these are all in Ward Five, and um, we've uh, they've all been positively referred by the Transportation and Parking Commission. They meet the warrants for stop signs. Um, and they will provide safety at these T intersections. And um, Laura, do you just want to bring up the map for a second, just so people sure. can know exactly where these are? Yeah. So the one on, yeah, Clement Street at Burt's Pit Road is the first. This is a busy T intersection. Um, Middle Street uh, at Chestnut Street, there are sight lines um, by the buildings nearby that um, cause the, you know, really want to make sure people are stopping there. And then uh, at High Street and North Maple Street, North Maple Street has significant traffic um, that meets the warrants as well. Okay, counselors, any questions for Councillor Jarrett? I'll move approval. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? 
Hearing none. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Moulton. Yes. Okay. Uh, item 22.221, an ordinance relative to stop signs on Middle Street, High Street, and Clement Street has been approved. I see nothing else on the agenda. Laura, we went about 40 minutes longer than you thought, right? But, you know. I will move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Okay. Motion made by Councillor Perry, seconded by Councillor Foster. Uh, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Super yes. <laughs> Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay. We are adjourned.